We're good. Okay. So this morning we are going to look at orders of the Dáil and Shannon on a variation of the title under the Health and Social Care Professional Act 2005. This meeting will meet with officials uh, from the department in relation to recent orders passed by the Dole and Shannon on the Health and Social Care Professional Act 2005, Section 95.3, Variation of Title, Physical Therapists, Regulation 2018. So I'd like to welcome uh, Ms. Deirdre Walsh and Mr. Aidan Tumbleton. And perhaps you, Ms. Ms. Walsh, would give your opening statement. Thank you. Thank you. Chairman and members of the committee, I want to begin by thanking the Chairman and the Committee for inviting us here today to talk about the draft regulations to be made by the Minister for Health to protect the title of physical therapist as a variant of physiotherapist. I would like to introduce myself, uh, well actually the Chairman has introduced us, uh, regulations. Uh, the House of the Oireachtas are being asked to approve the following regulations in draft. Health and Social Care Professionals Act 2005, Section 95.3, Variation of Title, Physical Therapist, Regulations 20. These regulations are being made pursuant to the Health and Social Care Professionals Act 2005. The Act provides for the protection of the public by promoting high standards of professional conduct, education, training and competence through statutory registration of the health and social care professionals designated under the Act. Regulation under the Act is primarily by way of registration of practitioners and the statutory protection of professional titles. The use of protected titles is restricted to practitioners granted registration under the Act. The registrants must comply with the Code of Professional Conduct and Ethics and are subject to fitness to practice rules similar to those applying to nurses, midwives and doctors. The structure of the system of statutory regulation comprises registration boards for the professions, a committee structure to deal with disciplinary matters and the Health and Social Care Professionals Council with overall responsibility for the regulatory system. These bodies are collectively known as CORU. The Act prohibits a person whose name is not on the register from using the title of a designated profession and provides that CORU may initiate a criminal prosecution similarly to an summarily to enforce the prohibition of a designated title's misuse. The title of physiotherapist is currently specified under Section 79 of the 2005 Act for the exclusive use of qualified professionals registered with the Physiotherapist Registration Board. The Physiotherapist Registration Board first met in June 2014 and one of its first items on its agenda was protection of title and how best to address the question of protecting the title of physical therapist. In other English-speaking countries, physiotherapists often use the title of physical therapist interchangeably with that of physiotherapist. However, in Ireland, in the absence of regulation and of title protection, the title of physical therapist has been used by other providers of musculoskeletal therapies practicing in the private sector. Those currently using the title of physical therapist are predominantly members of the Irish Association of Physical Therapists. This association has approximately 300 members, most of whom are degree level graduates of the Institute of Physical Therapy and Applied Science in Dublin. Like physiotherapists, graduates of the Institute provide musculoskeletal therapies. Physiotherapists, however, are also trained to provide cardiorespiratory and neurological therapies. In 2016, the then Minister for Health, Leo Varadkar, concluded extensive consultations with the Registration Board and other relevant organisations concerning the protection of title. He decided that by that protecting the title of physical therapist under the Act as a variant of the title of physiotherapist would be the best way to eliminate the risk of title confusion and the consequent risks to the public safety. The Physiotherapist Registration Board established its register on the 30th of September 2016. The two-year transitional period ended in September 2018, at which time entitlement to use the title physiotherapist was confined to members of the register. The Health and Social Care Professionals Amendment Act 2017 provided for the registration in the register of physiotherapists on a once-off basis and for a limited period of time, ending December 2018, of certain qualified users of the title physical therapist and facilitates the Minister in making regulations to prescribe the title physical therapist as a variant of physiotherapist. 
Section 95.3 of the Health and Social Care Professionals Act 2005 provides that the Minister for Health, after consulting the Registration Board of a designated profession and any organisations that he or she considers appropriate, may, by regulation, prescribe one or more than one title that is variant of the title designated in the Act for the profession. Section 95.7 provides that a regulation may be made under subsection 3 only if a draft of the proposed regulation has been laid before the House of the Oireachtas and b a resolution approving the draft has been passed by each House. The effect of prescribing the title of physical therapist as a variant of the title physiotherapist will be to protect both titles under the Act by confining their use solely to res re registrants of the Physiotherapist Registration Board. The regulation was laid before both Houses of the Oireachtas in June this year. The motions to approve the regulation were moved in both Houses of the Oireachtas on October 16. It is proposed that the regulations will come into operation in December 2018. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much, Ms Walsh. Uh, Deputy Donnelly. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Can I just ask in layperson's language, my understanding from this is essentially physiotherapy and physical therapy will now be interchangeable. Yes, the title. The title. The title. For, for those on the register. It's confined to those on the yeah. register. So once you've got your qualifications and yeah. you've been approved by KORU, uh, you're, you're registered. registered. Um, but physical therapists, from, from your statement, mm -hmm. physical therapists and, and physiotherapists mm -hmm. are, are different yes. in that f uh, physiotherapists have additional training and I don't know but I'm, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm guessing that within their this, the areas of similarity there still may be differences in their, in, in their training. Yes. It, is there therefore not a confusion that if, if, if a member of the public now walks into a, a, one of these therapists is it not useful to know who, who is a physiotherapist? If I understand from your briefing yeah. note, they are, yeah. maybe this is unfair, maybe they are, they are more highly trained or trained in a different yeah. way. Um, is, there, is there potential for confusion that the public won't be able to differentiate between the two? Well, I suppose the, the issue was exactly the point you're making. That's where we started off, where the public was confused because they didn't realise if they were going to a physiotherapist or a physical therapist. And then internationally, what we know as a chartered physiotherapist is known as a physical therapist internationally, so there was confusion. But in this case, you're correct in saying that we now on the Physiotherapist Registration Board, we have physiotherapists who are qualified in three streams, which is cardiorespiratory, neurological and musculoskeletal. And you have this limited number of registrants on the same register with an interchangeable title who only practice in the field of musculoskeletal. So they practice in one stream, the other practicing in three. So to, to ensure that there isn't a risk to the public, that's a once-off provision, so there won't be any more physical therapists of the one-stream category registered. But to protect the public, those physical therapists with the one-stream musculoskeletal practice have signed up to a code of conduct and ethics that they can only practice within their level of education and training, which is musculoskeletal. And if they stray outside that, they're brought to fitness to practice. Okay, so that, that is the protection that's there. So the group that are physical therapists mm. who have training in one area, one area, are they allowed to call themselves physiotherapists who have training in three areas? They are under the Act, although they're, the reason they sought registration was to continue as a physical therapist and to protect their profession in that stream. But in law, they are entitled to use both. Okay, and for a, for newly for new physical therapists who who graduate yeah. and begin to practice, will they be allowed to call themselves physiotherapists? No, the institute that did offer that course that course has now ceased. There won't be any further graduates of physical therapist, so they can't register. And that once-off window for those three hundred who had been practicing for twenty five years with established practices, um, there, there's no more opportunity post the. the the, the registration date. So on the big, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, there would be people in the future who will have qualifications in musculoskeletal therapies of mm. different kind, but they're not entitled to register with Karoo or use the protected title. So the the physical therapy training mm. 
is gone essentially. Gone. It's, okay. now it's now physiotherapy. And there are about 300. But 300 is slightly over. Physical therapists. Physical therapists and they're in the private sector. Who will Continue. presumably call themselves physiotherapists. Or can. They can. They, they can. can. But, but there's, it's, there's it's, not their, it's not their wish. The reason they yeah. sought the regu regulation was to continue as physical therapists. But they can call they themselves could. physiotherapists. They could. And is there any onus on them? So I understand they're signing up to a code of conduct that says mm. we'll oper they'll operate within yeah. the one stream they're trained yeah. in. Is there any way for a member of the public to know when you're walking in, is this person trained in one stream or is this person trained in three streams? Well, other than the member of the public asking, but also the physical therapists are quite clear uh, that their professional code is that they actually tell you that they're physical therapists and what the service they provide, just as a physiotherapist would tell you about the service they provide. So it's really back to the code of conduct and sticking to the ethics of their profession. How many physiotherapists are there? There are about, um, I think on the register, uh, between private and public sector, there are about 4,000. Okay, like that, yeah. so maybe about, okay, so, so three, 3, 300 three, of... 3 odd, 100 odd out of that okay. registry. So you're, 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 you've no concern about the public... Well, you, you can never say you have no concern, but I suppose you're relying on the code of conduct, you're relying on the ethics of both professions, and you're relying on the fitness to practice provisions okay. of the Act. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Deputy Louise O'Reilly. Good morning. Uh, I just, I'll be very brief. I just wanted to, uh, to thank you for the presentation and indeed for giving the time to this because obviously it was a very uh, contentious issue and I'm, I'm very happy that the time was given, the parties engaged and now a solution has been found that I think will benefit the general public and also uh, will ensure that the, um, that the titles are protected, which I think is what everybody wanted um, out of this. But just to, 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 to say my thanks for, and obviously we, we have been working with both groups <laughs> um, as you had yourselves uh, yeah. and we're, we're very pleased that this will, will go through. We, we won't be impeding it in any way. Thank you, Chair. Deputy Durkin. Yeah, Chairman, uh, just to uh, thank uh, our guests for, for uh, uh, the clarification. I, 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 I thought uh, this was a very uh, contentious subject mm. and we had copious representations about it and my question really is have all the concerns been alleviated and satisfactory at this stage and yes, so far as can be done? As far as is possible they've been alleviated, the registers are live, they're entitled to register and I think that has been addressed. So effectively the physical therapists have been phased out? Yeah they are. And been replaced by physiotherapists? physiotherapists. Uh, as and from now? Yeah, the physio agreement. yeah this, this year the physiotherapist register closed the 30th of September this year and the physical therapist will close on the, uh, about the 20th of December. We had to give them a slightly longer time just to get them registered. Thank you, Chairman. Yeah, Senator Burke. Yeah. Just on the, uh, one of the issues raised by the physical therapist was this issue about um, x-rays and their use of x-ray equipment. Has that been dealt with in the regulation? No, that was a separate issue. The physiotherapist raised that issue in the context of the Basic Safety Standards Directive, which is uh, being transposed into Irish law at the moment. So they were one of the professions that sought to be included as a referrer in that uh, directive. But the Minister, having considered it, um, is transposing the directive for those professions that are already covered under the older directive, so he's modernising it, if you like. So they're not being included in, at this point in time, but it has to do with a wider exercise. They were one of a number of professions who sought to be included in the Basic Safety Standards Directive, and it goes to the heart of scope of practice, what is the scope of practice, and extended scope of practice. So within the department, they're looking at um, workforce planning, and within that strategic framework, they're looking at the scope of practice for a range of health and social care professions. So that issue is in that basket, if you like. It's not appropriate to these regs. It's the Basic Safety Standards Directive. So it's not... It's not in this regular, no, and not. that applies the same as physiotherapists as it applies also uh, in relation to physical therapists. That's right, yes. Okay, and when is that likely, that scope of practice likely to be 
dealt with? It's part of the strategic workforce planning uh, framework, which is uh, is quite a large exercise. So you're you're right. you're looking into at least another, I would say, year, two years by the time that that comes around. But in the meantime, if someone, for our own sake, if someone was providing a service where they were involved in um, providing X-ray facilities mm. or X-ray, um, uh, you know, carrying out X-rays, and, and are you saying they're they're technically not entitled to provide that now? No, they're entitled to provide what they've always been providing within the health service. But under okay. the basic safety standard directive, they were looking to do extra. They were looking to expand their scope of practice, which was very specific to the provisions of ionising radi radiation within the right. basic safety standard directive. So what they could always do, they can still do, but they won't be extending into the basic safety standards directive. But just for clarification, so if you had a physical therapist or a physiotherapist who was also providing services in relation to x-rays? At the moment. At the moment. Yeah. And have been for, say, a number of years. Yeah. They can continue... They can continue doing what they've always yeah. done. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Thanks very much. Okay. Uh, but thanks again for the, the work done, and this is very much appreciated, and uh, taking on board the concerns that the physical therapist had in relation to the regulation and uh, thank you very much for the work and all the, uh, the department officials for their work on the matter. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Burke. And finally, Deputy Durkin. Yeah, Chairman, there's something caught my attention there, as I'm sure you would have suspected, this uh, ionising uh, radiation, uh, which uh, applies in another area as well, which the committee has dealt with. Uh, can I ask if it is the, your opinion that uh, this uh, radiation directive uh, is likely to apply to a whole other range of other uh, health associated um, uh, professional uh, bodies. And uh, what's the, 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 the situation at the moment? Is it, uh, is it being pursued selectively under particular headings, or is it obligatory to transpose into Irish law uh, regardless? Well, it's, it's obligatory to transpose the directive into Irish law, and as I was uh, saying to Senator Burke, the, the, the way it's being dealt with, because it's quite complicated, um, is that the older version of it applied to radiographers and radiologists in the main. They're the professions that were entitled to use the, the basic safety standard directive. In the modernised one, they're extending it and modernising it for the existing radiographers and radiologists, but beyond that it's still under debate uh, as to who may or may not be added into those professions or what, ex what number of professions might be extended but uh, the minister uh, has yet to sign the transpose directive and it's not yet completed thank you yeah that has implications for other issues we have discussed uh, mr chairman and I, I, I have to express my concern about it, uh, because I asked a question uh, quite some time ago as to where the, this um, uh, uh, decision, when was it first mooted and by whom? Uh, on, obviously on health and safety grounds, that's what it, we, we, we are told. But of course we don't know. It may have other, there may be other ancillary issues as well, uh, which we think we know. And... Um, uh, I think, Chairman, uh, uh, the, the, I think that in, in that there is a warning. We need to be careful how we proceed <coughs> in so far as the transposition into Irish law is concerned, and we will need to know whether it's going to be possible to include bodies or exclude bodies, or particularly include the bodies that have heretofore uh, had access to, for instance, radiology or, or referrals, and uh, will w obviously wish to continue to so do. And if I go to a physiotherapist or, or a physical therapist or whatever, um, I would expect to be able to have uh, full access to what is required, including x-ray uh, treatment. If not, uh, then uh, that particular body providing the service doesn't have available to it all the full services that they require to do the job properly. And I would have worries about that. Thank you, Deputy Durkin. So, <clears throat> did you want a response, or is that a comment? Yeah, well, I, I, I'm a little comment. I, I, I'm, yeah, well, um, I, I'm not working on the Basic Safety Standard Directive, so I, I, I can't really comment beyond that. 
It would be a help to us, Chairman, I think, if, if somebody were to tell us, uh, you know, with whom uh, this particular uh, 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 proposal originated. I, I'm a great believer in, 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 in uh, uh, drilling down to find out where the information comes from. If there's oil coming out on the, on, on the top, and it must be going from somewhere. And the same way, if there's a pressure for a particular directive to proceed in a particular fashion, um, sometimes it's for a good reason, but sometimes it's for reasons of exclusivity, for want of a better description. So I would, I would, I, if, there, if there's any possibility of getting information as to who the driver of that particular directive is, I would like to know. Okay, we can okay. take that back with us. Thank you very much. Thank Mr. you. So, uh, on behalf of the committee, uh, I would like to thank you, uh, Mr. Deirdre Walsh and Mr. Tumbleton, uh, for appearing today and providing us with the relevant information in, rela in relation to the regulations. In accordance with Dole Standing Order 90 and Shannad Standing Order 75, messages will be sent to the Dole and Shannad advising that the, the Joint Committee has completed its consideration of the order that Dole Aaron and Shannad Aaron approves the following regulation in draft Health and Social Care Professionals Act 2005, Section 95 3, Variation of t Title Physical Therapist Regulations 2018. Is that agreed? Agreed. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for coming in and giving us your time. I'm sorry for the delay in bringing you in. We had other matters to discuss. Thank you. So we'll now suspend for a few moments to allow the witnesses in our next session to take their seats. Agreed? The purpose of this second session this morning is to hear details of the projected overspend on the health vote 2018 with officials from the Department of Health and the HSE presenting to the committee. On behalf of the committee, I would like to welcome Mr. Colum Desmond, Assistant Secretary, Finance Unit, and Ms. Fiona Pendergast, Principal Officer, Finance Unit, and from the Department of Health, Mr. Stephen Mulvey, Mulvaney, Chief Financial Officer and Deputy Director of the HSE. I wish to draw to your attention the fact that by virtue of Section 17.2L of the Defamation Act 2009, witnesses are protected by absolute privilege in respect of their evidence to this committee. However, if you are directed by the committee to cease giving evidence in relation to a particular matter and you continue to do so, you are entitled thereafter only to qualified privilege in respect of your evidence. You are directed that only evidence connected with the subject matter of these proceedings is to be given, and you are asked to respect the parliamentary practice to the effect that, where possible, you should not criticise or make charges against any person, persons or entity by name or in such a way as to make him or her identifiable. I also wish to advise that any opening statements that you have made to the committee may be published on the committee's website after this meeting. Members are reminded of the long-standing parliamentary practice to the effect that they should not comment on, criticise or make charges against a person outside the Houses or an official either by name or in such a way as to make him or her <coughs> identifiable. Can I now invite uh, Mr Colum Desmond from the Department of Health to make your opening statement. Thank you, Chair. Chairman, I welcome the opportunity to address the Joint Committee on the forecast outturn for 2018 for the Department. Vote 38. For 2018, the Government approved gross expenditure of €15.322 billion Euros for the health services, €14.839 billion for current funding and €493 million Euros for capital funding, representing a 4.9% increase on the original vote budget for 2017. The improving economy has enabled the health service to achieve much needed budget increases in each of the last three years. We are of course very aware that there are areas where further improvements are required and the Department will continue to work with the HSE to optimise service provision within the constraints of available funding. Demographic pressures, including a rise in chronic diseases and an ageing population, mean that we face challenges into the future. Implementing our strategic responses to these challenges while continuing to focus on effective management of resources to ensure that services are delivered in line with the National Service Plan and within budget. Not only 
has our population uh, over 65 and over 85 increased significantly, but due to the continuous improvements in health delivery, more people are living longer with more illnesses, requiring increased ongoing support from the health system. In, in considering the drivers of expenditure in any given year, it is important to recognise the interdependencies that exist. For example, a policy goal seeking to improve client safety, underpinned by improved regulation, can be delivered through a range of interventions which may drive a requirement for increased staffing and new roles. There are almost 1,100 designated centres and disability services that require to be registered by HICWA. In addition, 790 individuals were identified nationally in 2017 as requiring an immediate service response in terms of residential placement. Notably, death or incapacity of the main carer was the main driver, accounting for 29.5% of these requirements. In the case of drug spend, the main drivers are high, new high-tech drugs expenditure in areas such as cystic fibrosis, rheumatology and cancer drugs, and increased spend on drugs under the long-term illness scheme for conditions such as diabetes, cystic fibrosis and epilepsy. It is important to note that a number of service areas are purely demand-driven, and spending can increase the budget, exceed I'm sorry, the budgeted allocation, where forecast assumptions of demand levels differ from those experienced. Health is one of the few public services which has its pension costs reflected in its vote. Changes to pension rates and the fact that pensioners are living longer has resulted in a significant increase in the share of the health vote which is attributable to pensions. Similarly, the inclusion of costs associated with the State Claims Agency has an impact on the health vote annually. Whilst an assessment is undertaken each year, it can be difficult to forecast, and the increasing cost of settlements is determined by the court system and is not within the remit of the health sector. Finally, the nature of health services is such that the normal budget management levers available to other sectors, such as reduction of services, are simply not available to the HSE in some areas. The winter of 2018 was a, a very difficult one for our health services. During the month of February, we saw a 7.7% increase in attendances and a 5% increase in ED admissions compared to February 2017. This growth in demand is well ahead of population growth and reflects international evidence that emergency department demand is driven by more than demographic factors. This increased demand was further exacerbated in March by the impact of Storm Emma and the associated severe weather experienced across the country. Other external factors, such as the actions of the private health insurers, are also driving the need for additional funding. In relation to the, 2000, the financial position, 2018 outturn, rather, while it is still too early to accurately forecast the year-end position, significant deficits are emerging, driven in large part by the issues referenced above. For example, a private patient income shortfall of, of around 100 million arising from the campaign by the insurers to dissuade their policyholders from using their insurance when admitted through an ED. Higher level of state claims agency payouts than budgeted, approximately in the area of 50 million. Primary care reimbursement services driven by costs and demand for drugs, especially high-tech and long-term illness, in the range of 95 million. Higher level spend on national reform projects in the range of 40 million. Higher level, higher level of spend on service areas, acute and social care, in the range of 220 million. And non-achievement of tranche three of the value improvement programme in the range of 150 million. The overspend in the service areas is driven by a number of factors, including the non-achievement of value improvement programme targets, higher levels and higher complexity of demand, costs associated with meeting national standards and emergency placements beyond the level funded. Based on spending year to date, it is clear that there will be an overrun in 2018, and in that context, the announcement by Minister Donoghue that he intends to allocate an additional 700 million to the health service in 2018 by way of a supplementary estimate is most welcome particularly bearing in mind that it has been possible to carry this additionality into the base for 2019. In relation to capital, in drafting the capital plan 2018 to 2022, the HSE identified a deficit in construction capital funding for 2018 of 109 million. During 2018, Extensive measures to actively manage the capital budget have been applied. This has involved balancing as much as practicable the fulfilment of contractual commitments, delivery of projects and managing equipment and infrastructure risk issues such that capital expenditure remains within profile. Following this extensive engagement and management of issues, capital spending to September 2018 remains within profile. Nonetheless, there are limits to which such a level of funding shortfall in the year can be managed. As the year-end approaches and following implementation of the measures noted above throughout through the year, the projected year-end deficit has been managed down with no further viable options available to meet this gap.
However, the Minister for Public Expenditure and Reform has approved a further £20 million to be allocated to bridge a portion, proportion of this gap in 2018 as part of the overall supplementary estimate amount. Therefore, in conclusion, despite welcome increases over recent years, a financial challenge remains as we deal with a larger and older population, with more acute health and social care requirements, increased demand for new and existing drugs, and the rising costs of health technology. The cost of payments under the State Claims Agency are also rising, adding to the overall cost of health above the operational costs funded to meet the health demands of a growing and ageing population. The HSE is reporting significant overruns year to date and the Department continues to work closely with the HSE <coughs> to identify measures to reduce the projected deficit through mitigating actions without impacting service levels. It is now anticipated that the bulk of VIP1 savings for this year will be achieved in 2018 as well as a small amount of savings under VIP2. We must maintain our focus on improving the way services are organised and delivered and on reducing costs in order to maximise the ability of the health service to respond to growing needs. It is essential that those managing and delivering those services demonstrate good practice by delivering the best possible health care within the limit of resources that have been made available by government each year. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Mr. Bevins. And now, uh, could I ask Mr. Stephen Mulvaney to make your opening statement? Thank you. Good morning, Chairman and members of the committee. Thank you for the invitation to attend the committee meeting today. The HSE spent €14.3 billion Euro on the provision of health and social care services in 2017. This excludes capital spending. The 2018 budget for the provision of these services is €14.6 billion, which is €224 million, or 1.6% above what was spent in 2017. The 2018 budget is €608 million, or 4.4% higher than the 2017 budget. This is made up of pay rate funding for existing staffing levels, 278 million, funding support for existing level of services, including demographics, 134 million, and funding for new developments, 195 million. To the end of August 2018, the HSE has spent 10 billion euro on the provision of health and social care services to service users, patients, and their families. This is 485 million, or 5.1%, above the level of budget available to the end of August. 43% or 206 million of this 485 million overrun relates to unfunded cost growths in 2018 that are outside of the areas of spend which are amenable to normal management control efforts or relate to exceptional costs such as those associated with Storm Emma. This includes primary care reimbursement service 50 million, state claims agency 32 million, local demand led schemes and overseas treatment 24 million, pensions 9 million, acute hospital income issues related to the actions of insurers 63 million and exceptional items including Storm Emma 28 million. 37% or 180 million of this 485 million overrun relates to a shortfall in the target savings necessary to offset the unfunded cost of services that were running throughout 2017. Despite this, some 37 million of savings under the Value Improvement Programme are being reported by our community healthcare organisations and hospital groups at the end of August. This figure is indicated to be circa 60 million in savings by year end. In addition to this, there are significant centrally generated drugs and medicine saving related savings being delivered by the primary care reimbursement service. For example, 27 million on a clinical protocol driven access initiative and acute hospitals, 12 million on the framework agreement with suppliers. Finally, 20% or 99 million of this 485 million overrun relates to other unfunded cost growths in 2018 within our operational service areas. The provision of disability services to service users with intellectual and physical and sensory disabilities accounts for 29 million of this residual 99 million, i.e. emergency residential places 19 million, costs associated with HICWA registration of residential services 7 million and home support 3 million. Behind these numbers are many individual stories of service users with intellectual disabilities requiring residential care on a crisis basis due to the breakdown in their family caring arrangements. On a positive note, very substantial progress has been made in achieving HICWA registration of residential centres. The provision of services to older persons accounts for 22 million of this residual 99 million overrun, i.e. home support 5 million transitional care beds 2 million and public residential units 15 million. Ireland's population aged 85 years and older is growing at circa 4.3% per annum, significantly above the EU average. 
The provision of acute hospital services accounts for 50 million of this residual 99 million, with this being partly attributable to additional activity levels and the growing complexity and cost of care as the average age of patients increases. In addition, bed occupancy levels in our acute hospitals at 94% are the second highest in the OECD and well above the OECD average of 77%. Levels consistently above 85% are indicative of a system operating under considerable stress with knock-on implications for efficiency, quality and cost. Based on the data to the end of August, it is clear that the full year cost of providing essential health and social care services in 2018 will significantly exceed the available funding. In that context, the HSE very much welcomes the announcement by Minister Donoghue that he intends to allocate an additional €700 million Euro to the health service in 2018 by way of a supplementary estimate. It is particularly welcome that it has been indicated that this additional allocation will remain in the base funding of the health service going into 2019. It is understood that £625 million of this £700 million will be allocated to the HSE to offset overruns in operating costs, with £20 million being allocated to support ongoing HSE capital investment. HSE national directors and their teams, as part of the ongoing performance management process, have been working throughout the year reviewing current costs with a view to reducing the level of overrun, and this will continue to be intensified, continue and be intensified to year-end where this is practical. This is necessary to minimise the amount of any residual 2018 overrun. This concludes my opening statement. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Mulvaney. Now we're going to take contributions from our members, and first member is Deputy Stephen Donnelly. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you all very much for your time and for your, um, for your statements. Uh, the overrun, obviously, this year is um, huge. Uh, at 700 million, and, and we'll see what it gets to by the end of the year. Um, and not only, obviously, is it a vast amount of money that we have to vote through again this year, but it has very serious implications for next year and for the following years. So the budget documentation has now provisioned more than 600 million, I think 625 million, for all future years based on this year's overrun. So the health budget is going to go up by nearly 1.7 billion euro. But, but over 600 million of that will be for the overrun. There's demographics, there's pay agreements, and when you strip it all out, there isn't enough left to get serious about Slauncher Care, about modernisation and scaling up of the system. Um, and so the overrun doesn't just affect the Exchequer this year, but I would argue that 625 million that has to be allocated to cover the overrun essentially means launch of care isn't happening next year. Launch of care requires about a billion a year. You can probably pare that down a bit. So, obviously, the implications of these overruns are enormous. Um, so, in looking at the profile of overruns, there's been there have been overruns for quite a long time. But between, say, 2008 and 2011. The overruns were between 70, 70 million and 200 million, still significant. But then they jumped to over 300 million. And then by 2014 onwards, we were up at 500 million, 600 million, 660 million, and now this year, 700 million. So while obviously you may get overruns in health for unforeseen events, there has been a massive leap in the overruns. We're, we're, we're now tipping along at overruns of 700 million a year and have been for the past few years, except uh, 2017 is a bit of an outlier. Can I ask, what's going on in the last few years that is different to previous years, where we were looking at much more modest overruns and we now have these enormous overruns? So given that there are, there are always crises in health, there are always storms, uh, there are always expenditures on drugs that were unanticipated. There is always a certain amount of unanticipated um, activity in healthcare. Why are the overruns now about three times more than they used to be um, about a decade ago? What, what's going on? The, um, Mr. Deputy Donnelly. Mr. Desmond, thank you. 
The health sector has benefited from supplementary estimates in, in, in recent years and they can vary depending on the requirements. Um, the position on overruns is, as explained, mainly demographic driven to an extent and also unforeseen areas, which does require a supplementary estimate. Um, historically, it has varied, Deputy, um, to a fair degree. And it, it hasn't been the case necessarily that it has been technical. For instance, in recent years there was a significant additional allocation made um, of 500 million in one particular year, but it wasn't actually technically a supplementary estimate. So the nature of the health sector is that there is a degree of unpredictability in terms of the service requirement, but also um, other areas which are not um, service related, such as I mentioned in my opening statement. In relation to Slauncher Care, I can deal with that um, as well if you no, wish, in terms no, of the provision. I, I, no, I'd like, to, I'd like to stick on this. I, I, look, with the greatest respect, I, I, I don't think that's a reasonable answer. Uh, demographics are predictable, and demographics should never lead to overruns. We know how many people there are in the country. We have a pretty good idea how many people are going to be in the country next year. So demographics are not unforeseen. Demographics are planned for in any budget. So demographic changes can't, can't be the issue. And whilst there have been overruns, we have 10 years of, 11 years of information here. While there have always been overruns, they have trended significantly upwards. So there are always unanticipated events in healthcare, but there's an, unanticipated events in everything. There's unanticipated events in transport. There's unanticipated <coughs> events in running a coffee shop. And anyone who is budgeting for their year, be they running a coffee shop or be they running a 17 billion euro healthcare system, puts in provisions. You put in uh, discretionary amounts of money to deal with unforeseen events like storms or outbreaks of flu or, or whatever it is. So I don't accept demographics. I don't think it is reasonable to say demographics is a reason for an overrun. Demographics are entirely predictable and, and can be budgeted for. My question is, why are the overruns twice to three times more over the last four years uh, than they used to be. Something is, is, is the, the wheels are coming off here. Some, something is going more wrong than usual. Um, and my question is, what is that? What has happened in the last four or five years that is different, that is leading to these uh, multiples in terms of the scale of the overrun? Um, just, uh, you need to look at the specifics of each year and what happened in that year. So we've set out where in year to date 2018 the deficits are occurring and people can form a judgment as to which of that was anticipated or not. If we look at the performance for the end of the last finished year, which is 2017, if you add the supplementary at that time, which was 208 million, and the residual deficit we were left with of 164 million, you end up with 166, a 374 million problem. Now, in, in 2017, is that in right? In 2017, if you take supplementary plus what was the deficit after the supplementary. Now, um, that is a larger deficit than in some other years. Yeah. Uh, there are years when the health service has broken even. But if you look at that, you have to look at its components. So <coughs> what was inside that 374 million and which parts of it could you realistically say were a performance issue or potentially a performance issue? So the first part of that supplementary was a 75 million increase in the allocation to allow for a public sector-wide central government decision which said there was a pay award due on the 1st of October 17, government decided to bring it forward to the 1st of April. That costs 75 million. So is that 75 million of 374? Is that a performance issue? No. That's simply a decision made in year by government and it's totally appropriate. Um, 50 million is the cost of the state claims agency. Now that is an area which in fairness is very difficult to predict. Between actuarial estimates and you know, run rate estimates, it's very difficult to come up with the actual figure. The key point from a performance management is, as people in this room know, the state claims agency is not the HSE's lawyer, it's the HSE's insurer. It has its own statutory powers, and the money that we're paying to the state claims agency, yes, it is for HSE-related claims, but it's related to claims that happened a number of years ago. So does that 50 million relate to a performance management issue inside in the health service, which I think is what's at the root of your question? The answer is no. So that's 50 million. Government then decided in 17 to have a access stroke winter investment plan, post the service plan, of 35 million. 
That's not unusual. So that's 35 million of this overall supplementary and residual deficit. The next big item, and again, people can have a, a judgment on this, but in 2017, uh, within that overall 374 million space, there's 121 million euro is the impact on acute hospital income, um, including bad debts, of what we would refer to as the actions of private insurers. Now, leaving aside whether it's appropriate to, for what, uh, whether what they're doing is appropriate or not, the reality is they are doing it. And despite the fact that our hospitals have improved their income processes, there's an element of this that they can't actually deal with. Okay? So that 121 million we would put forward does not, it is in the performance management space because we have to manage the income and we do seek to manage the budget we have, definitely not the one we would like to have. But that 121 million we're satisfied broadly is not a performance management issue for our hospital groups. Could I, Mr. Well, Mavani, yeah. sorry, sorry, apologies for cutting you off. Just and and I, I know you're 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 trying to answer the question in detail. I know you're not trying to avoid the question. I'm asking a higher level question, right? So what you're doing is you've you've taken one year, which is perfectly reasonable, and you're you're itemising the spend. I'm asking a higher level question. The question I'm asking is. Up to 2013, let's say, the overruns were in the region of 1 to 200 million. From 2014 onwards, they have jumped from 1 to 200 million to 6 to 700 million consistently every year. So something has changed. Because the issues that you're describing are fine, but there are issues in any year. Obviously, healthcare is complex, it's a big budget, unforeseen events happen, a government make decisions to do things in particular years and bring things forward. But something has changed. If we're, if, we're, if we're looking at profiles of 1 to 200 million and they suddenly jump to over 600 million and stay over 600 million and are now 700 million, something has changed. So rather, I'm, I'm not asking you for the specific detail in any year. I'm asking why is it that the overruns have tri they, from 2014 onwards, they more or less tripled and have stayed up at that level. That says to me that something has has changed within the HSE, within the population, within the department, within government, I don't know. But something has changed. Can, can, you, can, can you help us understand what has changed that we have this massive increase in the overruns and they've stayed up there? I'm not uh, trying to avoid the, kind of the general nature of the question, but if I look at figures that I have from 2008 to 2011, that's a four year period, I have a total for let's call it supplementaries of 1.4 billion. So that's about 300 million on average a year. Now there's lots of complexities in some of these figures. In the next year, then 2012 is 360, then 2014 it's 219. And then it does go to 680 and 649 in the following two years in 14 and 15, right after, I suppose, that that's the uh, coming out of recession piece. You can, uh, you know, you'd have to have a kind of a more detailed discussion about what exactly happened inside that. 2016 is an interesting year. The HSC did get, um, an extra 500 million. But it got that extra 500 million on the 5th of July, and that 500 million began being, being spoken about by the end of April. It wasn't a supplementary. Now, you could argue that's a technical point. But, you know, I, I would. Um, it, it, is, it is a technical point. There was a, there was a budget agreed, voted through by the Dáil, to deliver against a service plan, and then an additional 500 million euro was added to it. Early so, the year. Yeah. So I think you'd have to look at each individual year and see what are the specific issues. I mean, the, the, the health service deficit is a combination of the demand, the, let's say, the capacity at which the health service manages the budget it's given, and whether it does that well or not, and whether the budget that was set is the right budget in the first place. It's, it's in those, those three spaces. Um, I don't have a specific answer as to um, why has it been different in the last three or yeah. four years? I have the specific answers as to what's happened in each of those years. No, I, and I appreciate that, and, and I know you can detail all of that, and, and that's fine. Um, but I, I would put it to you that anybody looking at these figures, if you were running a coffee shop or a hospital or a healthcare system or anything else where you have a, where you have a budget, if you see yourself overspending by a certain amount per year, and then that jumps by a factor of two or three and stays up there, something has happened and anyone looking in at this who's running a business in Ireland or who's running a nursing home in Ireland or who's running a charity in Ireland uh, I think would be asking themselves that question. They'd say well we're, we're overspending by a bit, now we're overspending by a huge amount and it's stayed up there, Some, something is wrong, something has changed and, and we need to understand it. Uh, can, can I ask, uh, on the chronology, right, I, I want to try and understand 
how this happens. So 2017, the Dáil voted through a health budget. On the basis of that budget then, the HSE produced a service plan. The service plan under legislation needs to fall within the budget allocated. Now, in fairness to the HSE, right at the front of that service plan, it raised serious concerns, it raised serious risks as to the potential overspend. And here we are, there's an overspend of 700 million euro. When uh, that budget was, or when the National Service Plan was presented to the Minister, with all of the associated uh, risks flagged, did the Minister go back and ask you to revise the service plan to one that dealt with the risks and provisioned for the risks. Because again, anyone watching this who's running a business or a charity or a GAA team anywhere in the country knows that when you're budgeting and you're, you're dealing with a, a sort, of, sort of a chaotic world where unforeseen things happen, as obviously they do in health and everywhere else, you, you provision for that. You know, anyone running a hospital knows that you provision a certain amount of overtime for emergencies and so forth. So, the Dáil voted through a 14 point whatever billion. The service plan was produced to the Minister. It raised very serious risks about the potential for overspend. We are now in that overspend. Was the HSE instructed to go back and come up with a budget that provisioned appropriately for the risks that it, that it yeah, foresaw? A small comment, just in, in part the answer, and I'll ask Colin maybe to talk about the, what the Minister did, but just to say that, and again, I'm not trying to be difficult about it, but your, your, your analogies of, you know, if you're running a coffee shop or a GA club or a charity or a, a business, unfortunately, as you know, the public health care system is none of those things. It is not as straightforward and as simple as any of those things. I'm not saying that your question is invalid in terms of, you know, there are questions there that need to be answered. What I'm saying is that comparative analogy doesn't really hold. You'd have to compare us with other public health care systems, perhaps. And just you, you mentioned a couple of times, it's a very specific point, and it's called out in our service plan. We do not have, nor do we ever, hold a contingency, a provision. We are not in a position to hold a contingency or a provision. In a normal, let's say, or in a private sector world, a contingency for an organisation of 17 billion would be something of the order of, I would guess, 2 to 4 per cent, which for us would be in the order of 300, 600 million. Mm. We do not hold such a contingency, and the service plan calls that out every year and is approved on that basis. Maybe Why? Well, why don't you hold a contingency? Because there simply isn't enough. Uh, funding for us to hold a contingency, and if you think about it, were we to hold such a contingency, um, how would that work? In other words, if, if in the centre of the HSE we were holding a large contingency yeah. and that was known, yeah. well, that could cause all sorts of motivational and other challenges. So, um, but the, whether it's we should or we shouldn't, the reality is we don't, and we call that out in the service plan, and the service plan is approved on that basis. I would be much happier if we did. Now, is there a contingency held somewhere outside the health service? I don't know. Yeah. But we do not hold one, and the service plan says that very clearly. And, and, and the pro the just the Deputy Dan, just the last question. Sure. Do you want to move the, on? Yeah. The, the problem with that is we're your contingency. <coughs> the problem is the taxpayer is your contingency. I mean, like anyone running a hospital, I, and, and I, I, I disagree with you. I understand healthcare systems are more complicated than coffee shops. But ain't, my point is that good budgetary practice, no matter how simple or complex the organisation you're running is, is that you predict uh, adverse events and you provision accordingly. Um, and you, we all know that. Now, what you've, what you've said is the HSE knows that things are going to go wrong, knows that there's going to be extra demands, but doesn't provision accordingly. Um, I, I, I think that's exactly the problem, which is why every year you, well, not you, but the minister has to come back. You go to the minister, the minister has to come back to the Dáil, uh, and we have to essentially go back to, to, to the taxpayer and say we need an extra 700 million, million euro. I, I would suggest that if you know that provisions are required, you, 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 should, provision, you should provision accordingly. Thank you, Deputy Donnelly. I'm going to bring in uh, Colin Desmond, and then I'm going to move on to Deputy O'Reilly. Uh, there will be an opportunity to come back in again. Sorry, Mr. Desmond. Yeah, Deputy, uh, health is obviously one of the biggest votes, and um, obviously there is a, a scale of funding that the government has available to it each year, which it has to allocate across a number of big priority areas, including ourselves and other sectors have supplementary estimates, of course, each year. Um, so, 
you know, we have to live within those overall resources provided to us, and that is a discipline that the Minister, of course, accepts. And as he pointed out yesterday, when the issue was raised in relation to potential um, a view from the HSC on a significant financial challenge, um, he made the point that the plan did require to be framed legally under the budget provided to the HSE, and that is what the HSC proceeded to do. Um, but naturally enough, um, you know, there are areas, which as I mentioned in the opening statement, and Mr Mavani alluded to them as well, which may be unpredictable to some extent, and it is therefore very challenging within the overall process to cater for the very substantial demands, which increase year on year in the major service driven areas as well as manage these unpredictable areas. It is absolutely fully agree with you, a challenge to do that and something which as the Minister alluded to yesterday as well is embedded within the performance accountability and planning process that the HSE <coughs> manages under and which it is held to account for. So um, I, I think that um, once uh, the HSE had identified certain issues, the Minister uh, naturally pointed out the requirement for the HSE to reduce under the legislation the service plan that, that was provided for this year, 2018. Thank Thanks. you very much, Mr. Thank you. Desmond. Uh, now, Deputy Louise O'Reilly. Thanks very much, uh, and thanks for coming in. Thanks for your statements. Um, I'll try and be brief, and we will have an opportunity to come back in, as the Chair has said. Uh, there's a, a section on efficiencies, and the estimated figure there is 346 million. Um, I, I'd be interested to know where that figure came from, how it was calculated, um, how much of it has actually been achieved. But specifically, I would actually be very interested to know uh, what components made up that figure, where. Uh, where it came from, how it was intended that, that it would work, did it arise out of discussions with the people, presumably, who were supposed to deliver the efficiencies? You might comment on that. Um, the, in 2019, the budget 2019, uh, <coughs> we see that current health expenditure is funded from tax receipts that are well, unreliable. I think everybody was a wee bit surprised. I certainly would be if I found that kind of money lying around. But anyway. um, is it prudent, in your opinion, to be funding the health service uh, in this manner? Um, because it, the additional funds appeared to materialise very, very close <coughs> to the budget. But there's absolutely no suggestion that they can be relied on uh, for the future. So perhaps you might have a comment on whether or not it is prudent to fund the, the health service in this way. Um, now, I see that throughout the, the, the documentation that we have um, the increase in staff costs and staff pressures and all, but surely you'll agree with me if you're citing a population increase as one of the reasons why there's constantly uh, an overrun and that overrun is increasing, there should be a consequent incre increase in the, the number of personnel. And I would have thought that that was something that you could easily plan for. Um, you know, X number of people uh, born, X number of people entering over 85 equals X number of, of staff. But just with regard to the staffing increases, you, you might give us, if you can, and you might not have it here, maybe you can provide it afterwards, um, a breakdown of uh, where the, uh, what grades, groups and categories of, of staff actually are make, make up that, uh, that increase. Um, you mentioned contingency uh, and that you, you don't run a contingency. Do you have a view as to what figure now, I'm fairly sure you're probably going to say anything uh, would probably be better than having no contingency at all. But do you have an idea just in, in terms of best practice, what kind of figure for contingency you would need? Because, you know, we've all seen uh, people come to the, the microphones and, and explain that, you know, the, the, the flu happened and, you know, that, that surprised people. Or winter happened and, and, and that was a surprise. And, you know, in terms of a contingency, how much... Would, would it be prudent, in your view, to actually have, and are there any plans for the future to perhaps have that, uh, that contingency amount? Um, 
And if I just go back to the efficiencies, we know that the figure for efficiencies was overestimated. I'm just wondering the extent to which uh, that was flagged uh, and equally with, with regard to the funding from volatile corporation tax receipts, has there been any correspondence between the two organisations to, to uh, comment on that? Has anyone flagged that that might not be the best way to, to fund our health service? Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Deputy O'Reilly. Um, Mr. Desmond? If I may, just on the general issue of tax receipts, the Minister for Public Expenditure would make, <coughs> excuse me, may make that assessment and publishes each year his um, uh, estimate of what is the available fiscal space within which he frames the budget. Mm. Um, that is uh, not a matter the Department of Health has a say on, or the HSE. Uh, naturally, we are well aware of the Minister for Public Expenditure's um, estimates in that regard, but at the same time we approach our um, framing of the demand each year for the health service on the basis of the needs that have been identified and, of course, having regard to what is the overall allocation that may be uh, the overall uh, position nationally will guide um, and will be guided by in terms of how we will approach uh, the Minister of Public Expenditure. Well, sorry, just on that, you are aware that the, I mean, I use the word volatile, but I'm not the only one that used that. I'm, I'm asking for a comment on whether or not it is prudent. Uh, to now have that included when it's not going to be available next year, once-off payments like that. It, it's, I don't think it's any, it, it is a prudent way to fund our health service, and, and I asked for a comment on that. I, I understand how, how it works, but I'm, I'm just interested in your view on whether or not that is prudent. Again, we can't make a call, Deputy, in relation to the overall uh, predictability of the fiscal position, um, which, does, which uh, governs uh, how all government expenditure is decided by the government each year in the budget. Uh, we can simply um, put forward proposals to the Minister for Public Expenditure, which are also guided by, to refer to your other question, um, an ongoing programme which is desirable of efficiencies to be achieved within the health sector, which is a very desirable thing to do and which will be necessary in any event and is stated as um, an underlying um, issue which will influence the delivery of the Slauncher Care programme, for example, for which we have set out in the budget to mention to Deputy Donnelly a certain number of provisions this year. I think that was raised. Um, so it's in that context that we and all departments therefore frame um, and are aware of what possibility or scope there may be, but essentially it is not our call in terms of the predictability or otherwise. Um, our job, I think, in fairness, is to seek to um, obtain as much as we can possibly for the services that have been justified to us by the health service executive that are needed year on year and also to take account as much as we can of those areas which are unpredictable which I mentioned in my opening statement and which can, Mr Mulvaney alluded to a certain number of them, which can arise during the year and can be unforeseen to some extent in terms of their magnitude. In terms of staffing costs, Mr Mulvaney may wish to comment on it but certainly we could revert with something in more detail on that matter. something on the staffing costs, we can certainly show the movement of staffing over any period, but your general point is absolutely correct. It is possible to predict or to make estimates of what would the required staffing level be, both to maintain existing level of staff and demographics. So, the, as you can imagine, the, across the public sector, the estimates and planning process has two large components. One runs up to the budget day where uh, departments and agencies like the HSE set out a view of what's required for the following year. Then budget day actually gives you what's available. Mm. And then the planning piece is about how you fit the, the, the demands as best you can within what's available. Um, within both sides of that process, we can make estimates and assumptions around what the cost will be in the following year. Now, without simply looking to give you a whole lot of excuses, the, obviously the health service is very large and very complex. Mm. And it's system challenges are well documented and we are working on that and there's you know we are making progress but it's a slow progress for the scale of the system we have we rely on at least 50 very large and over 2,000 in total organizations to deliver the overall service we don't ask them all to feed into the forecasting and estimates process but a number of them we do um, any future focus exercise as you know carries risks so typically when we're doing the service plan we have August and then September data so we're looking ahead 15 to 16 mm. months so you'll make some assumptions and every 10 to 1% margin of error 
for us, given the scale of our budget, is about 15 million. So, you know, there's a there's a, there's a, a, a big margin there. So, in the context of all of that, for both us preparing bids and service plan estimates, and obviously for those in the department and other colleagues who are reviewing them, you, you, you are looking at a set of uh, estimates and assumptions. Um, within that, in terms of calculating the um, value improvement programme tar overall target of 346 million that you mentioned in the service plan, in effect we went through an iterative process which looked at what is the level of service that we could currently provide with the, with the funding that was available, what level of activity within that um, can be if necessary, tailored to fit the funding at what level of activity is almost entirely demand driven, particularly in cases where, and this is where the health services you know is complex, we're the provider of last resort, we're the provider of 24 7 services, we're the place of safety. So, in a number of areas, including emergency departments and hospitals, disability, um, residential placements, and similar areas, there's a level of activity which is going to happen mm -hmm. even if there's a specific funding for it. So we determined through that iterative process that there was a need for about 346 million worth of savings. We set it out in three tranches. The first tranche was the more immediate and urgent priority, that was about 77 million. Against that, as I said in the opening statement, we would expect to deliver about 60 million of that. Um, and we're, I suppose, challenged in terms of delivering much beyond that against that 346. Now, I did mention we have other areas of savings where there is money being delivered, but obviously that's against targets that are set for them. So against that 346, the figure I mentioned is about what we'll get. Um, Sorry, that figure is 60. About 60 million. So we Out are of the short. 346. Yes. You are short. I mean, we are, we are come on, Stephen. Short. If you were in Tesco's now and 346 was the bill and you said you had 60, they'd say you were more than short. Um, just the, where did that figure come from? I mean, the, you must have estimated that you could make those savings. So you have to have looked at an area and said, we're currently spending X. I think we can. I mean, like, I, 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 I know well the health service and I know how hard people work in it, in administration, frontline service, right across the board. But somebody somewhere came up with a figure of 346. It, was that because you had to make that saving? So you said it has to be 346 and we'll see how we can do it? Or because you looked at the system and said, we think there's scope for 346? In which case, my question still stands is, where did you think you were going to find it? I mean, it's nearly November and we don't have a funded workforce plan for 2018. So, like, so it, definitely it's a combination. As I said, and I'm not trying to be obtuse about it, the first thing we had to do was to look at what level of service could be provided, what level of service had to be provided, mm -hmm. what was the funding available. And in part, that determined that there was a requirement to identify 346 million worth of savings. We set out in the service plan three tranches of that. The first 77 million, we said we had identified areas for that, and that was typically some drug savings, some agency and overtime savings, and other savings of that, of that order. We then were clear enough that there were other areas in as yet unidentified which made up the second and third tranches. So we, when we did the service plan, we hadn't identified those. Now, have we made as much progress as we would have liked to on uh, value improvement savings in 2018? No. Um, the reality is programmes like that take a number of years to get off the ground fully. So we are short on that. We accept that. There are, um, I suppose, significant issues to be overcome in terms of actually being able to get to focus on that level of savings. We did have a number of definitely unexpected uh, draws on management focus, including the storm and a, an extended winter surge. Now, these are perhaps excuses, but quite simply, were we overly ambitious? Maybe that's what will be viewed. The alternative to being overly ambitious, obviously, was not to be able to provide the level of service that we uh, have to provide and was necessary. So um, we need to be ambitious at times, but we do accept that we are falling short on that 346. Well, sorry, could, could I just ask, um, in the 346 uh, proposed savings, you said tranche one was 71 million? 77 million. 77 million. And they were identified areas where you could make savings? They were largely identified by the time the service plan was completed or shortly thereafter. And then the remaining uh, balance from 346 were in areas which hadn't been identified yet? Yes, and that's what that was said in the service plan. 120 million share was in areas that we described as uh, corporate type expenditure, whether it took place 
out in hospitals or in community or in the central corporate, but areas which should not impact services. So what we have done in that area is we've reviewed about 1.2 billion worth of spend in that area to look at opportunities to um, identify savings. And in some cases, saving, there is savings potential. Some of it will take a number of years to implement. That's areas like printing, postage, and a whole load of call it corporate type overhead areas. The balance of the 346 was 150 million, which was for a, a kind of a jointly governed program between ourselves and the Department of Health, which was specified as being longer term and as being, let's say, higher level in terms of what you were seeking to do. It wasn't just about simple efficiencies, which is what the middle piece of it was about. It was about how could you reshape the system now. Typically, that will take a number of years to achieve. So. I hope that's, that's so, so the 346 was, was really never achievable in, in 2018? The 346 was an ambitious uh, target chair, um, but it was necessarily ambitious given the constraints we were operating under. Chair, to, to labour this point, Stephen, 346 was identified. Sorry, Ms. Mulvaney, 346 was identified. Okay, it, where did it come? You know, I mean, a really simple budget, and, and I fully take your point. It's not the same as running a coffee shop. Okay, but when you are asked to make savings. You surely have to be realistic, and you, I mean, the, like the, even if it was 350, you might say that was a, that was someone uh, rounding up or whatever. But a specific figure of 346, I would have expected that you would come in here when I said 346, you would be able to say these are the savings we identified, and okay, you didn't hit the targets, and you know, and you were miles wide of them, and that's fine, you didn't. But at least you would be able to provide some rationale for that that figure of 346. But it's 346 million is, is just what you, you thought you might hope to save. Or I, I'm, I'm really at a loss as to how that figure came about. Okay. So again, definitely, <coughs> maybe I'm, I'm not explaining it well. The calculation of the figure initially was based on what was the cost of the minimum services that we had to provide, including services which were so demand-driven, such as emergency department and disability residential services, that we felt, even if we decided we couldn't fund them and wouldn't fund them, they would occur anyway. And when we added up all of that and did the arithmetic, the savings required was 346 million. And then we set out a programme. The first 77 million of it we identified, and that is largely being delivered. Um, 60 million worth of savings is not as consequential. I know it's a lot less than 346. We identified 119 million as um, we hadn't identified specific savings areas, we were targeting corporate type spend, as we said. We're far behind where we'd like to be in terms of reviewing that 1.2 billion worth of spend. And then the last piece was um, 150 million worth of jointly governed initiatives to be identified in the more kind of uh, policy or longer term space um, between ourselves and the department. Okay, and just one last thing. Uh, am I correct in saying there is no funded workforce plan for 2018 as yet? Um, well, the, the department has accepted the WT control limits that we proposed to year end. Um, does that equate to a full workforce plan? I'll have to check with my colleagues in HR. Um, is there a specific answer in, inside that workforce plan that we're trying to determine? I want to know if there is one. I mean, the, the funded workforce plan for 2018, I mean, you know, Maybe I'm being a bit rainbows and unicorns about this, but I, I would have thought it, you'd have it maybe December 2017. But now it's November 2018, and as I understand it, there were discussions with trade unions with regard to a funded workforce plan, and that they sort of. I, I, and again, I'm observing this. I'm not involved in them, obviously, but they they petered out, and we still don't have one as yet. So the position, deputy, is that in, on the 8th of April we submitted to the department our 2018 pay number strategy. And uh, in recent weeks, we have agreed an adjusted set of, uh, let's say, affordable staffing levels to year end with the department. There's one, one small thing to check. Mm -hmm. So we know the level of WTEs that we're trying to manage the system to to the year end. From that, we can extract, I've no doubt, and I talked to the, my colleague, National Director of HR, a figure for any specific area or grade discipline, let's say, as to how many are we able to put in by the year end. 
So I think we can probably give you the answer to the, the, the question. Mm. Thank you. Mr Desmond. And in regard to the submission of the uh, draft of the strategy in April and the recent agreement of control figures to confirm there's been a very substantial engagement between the Department and the HSE to try and assist to get the greatest understanding of the different components of the workforce. And that has an, you know, been an extremely significant and useful uh, piece of work that has gone on. And it's, it's something that's absolutely necessary given the fact that workforce planning and the funding of it is such a vital part of the Health Service Executive with such a significant part of the estimate is driven by salary and payment. So there has been extremely detailed uh, engagement on these issues to try and assist and get to that understanding. Uh, and as we say, we recently have agreed certain control figures in that regard with the HSE. We will be seeking to put into this year's service plan uh, at a high level, the WT level for uh, 2019. Thank you. And just before we move to Senator Burke, just to clarify, the, the, the figure of 346 million was arrived at when you calculated the amount of money it would take to supply services like A&E services, disability services. That was a deficit then that, that you had to make up. The 346 was a shortfall in your calculation on the essential services that you had to provide. I think, Chair, like in any forecasting <coughs> process, you're looking at funding that can come from different sources. So we knew the funding that was coming from the uh, Exchequer, we knew we had a view of what the costs were and the balance we're trying to address through savings. Okay. Uh, would I call it a deficit? I don't know, but that's what yeah. we're okay. trying to do. Now, that's that where was, the figure that's, that's the, where this figure started mm -hmm. and then it's, it's an iterative process after that, but yes, that's fundamental, okay. that's how we got there. Thank you very much. Now, Senator Burke. Yep. Um, very, thank you very much for your presentations here this morning, very much appreciate the work you did in preparing for those presentations. Um, I suppose there's one or, the issue, one or two of the issues that I'm very concerned about in the HSC is the growth in staff numbers um, since December 2014. My understanding is that we've now 12,000 additional people working in the HSC. Um, over 2,600 of those are in administration and management. And over the last three to four years, I have not set out, I have not seen a clear plan set out by the HSE about where they need to increase workforce. Yes, we've heard it about increasing nurses, about um, uh, additional doctors, but in relation to administration generally, I haven't seen an overall plan. And, you know, if you take it that there's an extra 12,000 people working in the HSE, Roughly, the cost of that is about 600 million per annum, additional cost. Uh, I may be open to correction on that, but I'm not clear as regards at what stage was there a plan set out as regards where were people required, what key areas were they required. It seemed to have been very much uh, a hit and miss, as suppose the case of whoever shouted loudest as regards getting additional staff. Uh, and in particular in administration, we've jumped from 15,000 to 17,600, administration and management. I'm just concerned about the lack of planning in that, and I've certainly not seen any <coughs> overall plan, for instance, for the next few years, how that's going to progress. Um, so I'm just wondering, you know, when you're talking about planning, you know, are we still only going on a year-to-year -year basis without having an overall objective? And for instance, you take um, the area of computerisation. You know, we've focused on employing additional staff, whereas we don't appear to have an overall plan in relation to computerisation. Um, or certainly it's very vague. And uh, when you look at other health services um, uh, around Europe, we're, we're way behind. And for instance, in Denmark, they're working, they've worked out that their whole computerisation programme is saving huge money each year because of the way they have done that, and they've been at it since 1996. Uh, and I haven't seen that coming from the HSE. Um, the, the issue in relation to the State Claims Agency, you were saying there that you know, this is an additional cost but the State Claims Agency is able to predict well in advance of cases being settled the value of cases. So surely the State Claims Agency should uh, be able to flag up uh, well in advance of a budget being drafted what's going to be paid out in the coming year. 
I mean, they, they have already made out for the next five to six years what they predict to be um, the level of claims. And I'm just a bit surprised that you're now saying that this is, um, I think it's 50 million. Um, sorry, the State Claims Agency was uh, 32 million. Um, I'm just wondering, you know, that's a huge figure that I would imagine that they haven't got their figures that wrong in, in predicting value of claims. So when they're, um, when you're corresponding with them before you do your budget, they're surely able to give you a fairly good guideline on what that is, and you might just clarify that issue. Um, the, um, the other problem that I have with the HSE, and I'm not sure whether there's a really any effort being made to do this, is the lack of uh, capacity to make decisions. And I find a huge amount of time and effort being wasted, and as a result, a huge amount of money. And, and I had the example recently, which I gave here in the committee before, where 12 me people were to meet over an issue which was raised 18 months earlier. 12 people in the HSE were to meet, one meeting here in Dublin, and the meeting was cancelled two days beforehand because one person said, I've now moved to a new job in the HSE, and therefore I can't attend the meeting. Meeting was cancelled. Therefore, there's a huge loss of um, waste of space, or, or waste of time in planning for the meeting and everyone organising for it. And then, and I'm finding this consistently with the HSE, the inability of people to make decisions and a huge amount of time wasted um, and how to make the organisation more efficient. We don't seem to have done any major work on that over the last few years. Uh, um, and, you know, um, Deputy Donnelly referred to the sudden increase in, in figures um, over the last few years. I suppose the concern that we all have is that that doesn't continue into the future. That if we're doing planning for a 12-month budget, that we can plan for, you know, carefully, um, so that there isn't an overrun. Um, like we have the figures in relation to change in demographics, we have the figures in relation to the number of people with um, disabilities. We also have the figures where, for instance, one of the key areas now in relation to disabilities, we have a huge number of uh, um, elderly parents looking after people with disabilities, and that's going to be a huge demand now on services uh, over the next few years. The other one that, that's, that I'm coming up against very much is about the lack of access for people once they reach 18 years of age who are in the disability services once they reach 18 years of age, um, the failure to provide any respite care for um, the parents of that uh, person. Uh, yet, you know, this person has now reached 18 years. We knew for the last 10 years what numbers would be ahead of us in relation to that age group. And there seemed to have been no planning done in relation to making provision for that. And they are the issues that I'm concerned about. You also raised about the fact that there was a, uh, a savings in relation to um, healthcare organisations and hospital groups, uh, towards seven millions of savings under the value improvement programme. But can we have detailed figures about where there were savings within the HSC itself? Because I haven't seen a huge amount of savings. It's easy out to impose savings on healthcare groups and voluntary organisations because you can say, well, this is your budget and this is what you're getting. Um, but I don't see the same effort being put in to HSE section of the organisations where they can make savings. Uh, and it's one of the areas that I'm, I'm concerned about that we have over 2,500 different organisations relying on funding uh, from the HSE. And yes, it's very easy for the HSE to dictate, and I think it's important that we get value for money from those organisations, but the same set of rules do not appear to be applying to HSE uh, internal sections of the HSE. And you might look for, I, I'd like to see some clarification on that, on that whole area. Thank you very much, Senator Burke. Um, so, so, Deputy, just in, in reverse order, maybe the, the, the 27 million savings I was referring to, 
the, the, when I talk about the community healthcare organisations and hospital groups, I mean the HSE. So the um, community healthcare organisations themselves are obviously part of the HSE. Okay. The hospital groups are also part of the HSE, albeit 16 of them are voluntary, large voluntary hospitals under, funded under Section 38. So, um, that, that 37 million is across the HSE. Some of it will also be in some right. of the volunteer right. organisations right. as well. The, um, in terms of the administration planning, so and, and ICT, so the HSE has set out a kind of an eHealth Ireland strategy and a very clear strategy as to how to develop and invest in uh, both clinical and non-clinical ICT. Um, with a view to obtaining all the returns from that, including um, efficiencies. So that, that plan is there, and we are making progress with the Department's assistance in seeking to get that funded. It was announced in there not that long ago about the, an EIB loan to assist with the funding of that. So there is a plan around ICT, and it is a long-term plan. Um, we do do three-year corporate plans in terms of, um, you know, it's not just relying on the annual service plan, albeit the annual service plan is there as well. It is probably fair to say that we don't have a single overarching plan for work yet for workforce setting out specifically where we want to go with administration and management staff. So that is a that is something that needs to be closed. However, I wouldn't accept that it's just he who shouts loudest. I mean, we have to remember those administrative, administrative staff categories are everything from grade threes that you meet inside the reception in your uh, clinic, right to be up in fairness to people at my level, uh, and to some staff who we would otherwise count as technical or professional staff like uh, engineers, HR staff, accountants and so on. So it's not just um, all senior general managers, albeit clearly the system has to be managed. But, uh, sorry, the argument was put to me about additional staff in, in clinics, uh, admin staff, and every person that I've talked to running clinics have said they've got no additional staff in the last two to three years. So I, I've not seen any evidence, and certainly anyone that I've uh, spoken to who's working the front line has not seen any evidence of increased levels of administrative staff supporting clinics. What we can do definitely is we can set out, I think we've done it before, the movement in administrative management staff over time and the movement at the different levels, you know, from the grade three right to be up. And I'm not saying there hasn't been an increase at the more senior level. Um, if you look at the scale of the HSE and take five as a large enterprise as defined by the EU, the number of very senior managers for every bundle of 500 doesn't compare unfavorably with what you would expect elsewhere. So, but we can certainly set out the movement in WTs at all the grades in administration going forward. Um, if, if, that, if that's a help. In terms of the SCA, the State Claims Agency, I'm not for a minute saying that they don't um, predict their costs. Those costs can be somewhat difficult to predict, and depending on which actuarial assumptions they use, they can vary quite a lot. There has been periods of time when there were certain levels of uncertainty around some of the costs. So the fundamental issue with the State Claims Agency, it, which is a part of um, the NTMA, as I understand, is when is government going to fund the cost that arises? And is it going to fund it at the start of the year or through the supplementary process? It is accepted that that is a cost that gets funded by central government. And in other votes, the equivalent of that wouldn't actually be in the, um, let's say, the main operational vote, just like pensions, public service pensions, mightn't be in the main operational vote. In health, they just are. Um, the, uh, the lack of capacity of the deputy to make decisions, I, I, don't, I don't have the details of the specific example you, you gave. I'm not saying it didn't, it didn't occur. Um, the HSC can be criticised for being overly bu bureaucratic, but for some people, making decisions via process of engagement and seeking consensus is part of how you do change management properly. So uh, I can't comment on a particular individual meeting um, that, that, that took place or was cancelled at, at short notice. But th this is a matter that was going on for 18 months, and this is not this is not unusual. I mean, the number of times I'm coming across that where I'm dealing with an issue which I dealt with 18 months ago or two years ago, and still no decision taken on it. And it's a huge problem that we're running up against, where you know, you talk to the person and say, well, we're waiting for someone up along the, level, uh, up along the line to make a decision on it. Uh, and I, I'll give an example of, say, GPs who went to the HSE uh, with a cost savings um, uh, project. And after 18 months of meetings, getting over, they threw in the towel on it. Uh, uh, and this was a, a project involving money savings that the HSE could make in relation to patients uh, who have hemochromatosis where GPs were offering to provide that service. They had something like six or seven meetings with senior people in the HSE, and after 18 months, 
no decision made, and they just threw in the towel and walked away from it. And this was something that where the HSE could have made major savings over a period of time. And, and Deputy, I'm, I'm not trying to be argumentative, but I don't know the detail of the example you've given. You've now given an example. I can check that. Um, sometimes parties view uh, views as to what savings can be made and how and what needs to be done to achieve those savings can differ. And um, well, I'm certainly happy to look into that one because obviously if there are real opportunities to make savings, uh, particularly those that actually take out uh, cost and we can apply it somewhere else, we'd be very anxious to, to be aware of that. But it may not be as straightforward as one party says they offered savings and the other party just would make a decision. That's not always the case when you dig into it. But, but I'm happy to, to have they, a look at it. But they gave a detailed report time and time again about how and they had the whole thing structured with a number of different organisations presented it to the HSE and after 18 months still no decision and they walked away from it. Debbie, if you have something to share on that perhaps we could yeah, look into it. That'd be yeah. great. Okay. You're happy, Deputy, or sorry, Senator Burke? Yeah, it's, it's just, I suppose, the, the overall planning and I suppose the, the other issue I raised about, you know, how we've had overruns uh, for the last number of years, how can we guarantee that we won't have the same scenario this time next year? You well, know, Chair, may the Government um, and the Minister for Health frame the budget based on the best assessment of what is available and what uh, way it can fund the services um, and the very many competing demands. So as we said at the, at the, the outset, it is a question of um, making a call on that within the available budgetary allocation available to the Minister each year and managing that throughout the year in the manner which we described and also accepting, as I did point out at the beginning, certain unpredictable issues. I just want to support my colleague in relation to the State Claims Agency. Timing is everything, and you can predict to a degree, but the timing of awards and the nature of the awards is something that is challenging at times. So um, that is a process that is managed and somewhat outside of our control. And finally, again, just to maybe a bit more detail, the e-health strategy and ICT is funded within the National Development Plan to a very substantial amount, which is a, a major advantage uh, which the Minister achieved in the National Development Plan last year. So that is... Um, uh, the firm basis for significant development in the area of e-health going forward. Okay. Um, you, you, you raised the question about respite for disability services. So we have a budget this year for about 54 million, and that allows us to provide for about 6,500 people a quarter uh, a level of respite. Um, is there more demand than, than that? Absolutely there is. Um, our task is to try and provide as much as possible of that service within the resource available and make the best use of that resource for the people who, who need it. But um, 6,500 per quarter is the level that's, that we're funding. And in fairness, that, that figure of 54 million is up about 10 million since last year. The Minister secured a specific investment of 10 million, which has been very helpful. Um, we're not saying that we couldn't spend more in that area, but that's, that's the level of resource and that's what it, it provides for currently. But we seem to have a problem with people who are reaching 18 now anyone who was getting respite care is continuing to get it but any new people who've reached the age of 18 certainly in the south southwest area are not able to get respite care now and that's a huge problem for parents and um, they're you know they're 24 7 providing care themselves and respite care is not available to them and it's a huge challenge now thank you senator thank you. Thank you. Um, now deputy uh, margaret omahani Thank you, Chair. Um, first of all, I'd like to welcome you all here this morning and thank you for coming. Um, I suppose, unfortunately, being last, many of the questions I wanted to ask have been asked already. I'd just like to uh, start by reiterating what my colleague, uh, Senator Burke, said about the lack of um, respite, etc., for people with special needs, particularly in Cork Southwest. It's a, it's a huge problem, um, particularly for parents who are now um, entering into the last part of their lives. And I think it, you know, if, if things could be planned better and with, with a guarantee that their child would be looked after when they either pass away or get um, too, too ill to mind them, it would give them um, great comfort. So it's something that I, I would ask you to look at. And also, Mr Mulvaney, there in your first point one, um, you were talking about the overrun relating to unfunded cost groups. Have you an exact cost for this, uh, the cross-border initiative? And, and I know it's, it's a EU, EU incentive, and obviously with Brexit now, it, it, you know, it's both plans are up in the air. But um, even though I, I think this is a good scheme, I often wonder if the 
like the HSE ha have to pay anyway. Um, if there would be another way around that people who are unable, say, to travel to Belfast, or particularly from Cork South West, it's a, it's a long, long journey to go to Belfast. And if, if the money could be made available to have their particular cataracts done, you know, down south, if it's going to cost the HSE the money anyway, is there any way around planning for that? Thank you. So, Deputy, to take the last question first, I'll have to provide you with some figures as to what the total, the, that 28 million figure or 24 million is the, the variance uh, at the end of August okay. on the four elements of that overall cross-border and local demand health schemes. I can dig out the specific piece of the cross-border and tell you what yes. we're spending on that and what the variance is on that. It's a particular um, uh, mandated scheme, so while we would always prefer to be able to provide sufficient within the country so that people don't avail of any of those overseas treatment options, yes. um, that one in particular which is different from some of the others, uh, taking the money from there and, and, and using it instead in kind of the more uh, distant areas from the border is probably not practical. The issue is trying to resolve as best we can uh, what's driving people to even think about going cross border which is fundamentally about providing better access to, to scheduled care in hospitals. Um, so yeah. I see the point or the speed as well, so the... Totally. You know, yeah. 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 Totally. So, um, and I accept the point about respite. I mean, there, uh, respite is an area we would like to invest in more. Yeah. And what we have to do is look at where we're investing money. It is something which can, I suppose, stave off the need for people to go into full-time residential care. Yes. And we know the uncertainty about that, both in disabilities and other areas, causes people to seek full-time residential care perhaps yes. earlier. So that, that point is understood. Okay. The issue is, can we put more into it? What's the level of resource available? And are we making best use of what we have? So it, it is seen as an essential... Uh, support and disabilities, yeah, just like transition care and respite is. Yeah, and again, services. it's a huge problem in, in West Cork. So, thank you. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Deputy O'Mahony. And before I go to Deputy Durkin, could I ask, if, if the National Service Plan keeps uh, missing its targets by six or seven hundred million, is there is there a problem with the National Service Plan process? Is, is are, are the pr predictive values of the National Service Plan consistently off target? How, how can you uh, adjust that, and is it fit for purpose? The second one is in relation to health insurance, which will now, I think, this year be estimated to be down 100 million. Is that 100 million from 621 million of a previous year? And in Sloan to Care, there is a proposal that private care would be removed from public hospitals, and how would the department and the HSC filled that gap. But that, that gap is getting smaller now by 100 million this year. Is that the case? And finally, um, in relation to the PCRS, um, I think there's a 50 million uh, increase in funding to the PCRS. Could, could you break down that 50 million into what categories in relation to PCRS that it represents? Thank you. From the department's perspective in relation to the National Service Plan, certainly it's a challenge to provide the services that are required each year within the overall allocation and the department and the HSE certainly strive to um, achieve uh, what is feasible and realistic um, within the allocation provided by the government. Um, in relation to the examples in the disability sector and other sectors, there are many challenges that are continuous in terms of the ongoing upward demand in certain areas like that, for instance, to actually um, create enough space to provide the services at the community level so that you, you can gradually over time reduce the dependency on the placements and the residential component, while at the same time recognising that that latter area is the subject of significant regulation as it should be and presents its own challenges in terms of catering for the need for people to have placements in residential settings. The service plan in 2019 certainly uh, the objective would be to frame that from the point of view of um, the most efficient use of the resources available to the health sector and to have um, an examination from the beginning across all of those areas and Mr Mulvaney alluded to it in the context of the value improvement programme as to <coughs> excuse me, where you actually do need to spend funding on an ongoing basis and what are the possibilities and the capacity to actually achieve greater efficiencies in that area. So that would guide the development of the service plan going forward and as part of that it would be accepted in all health services that you should have an objective of achieving efficiency savings in any event. It's certainly challenging 
but at the same time the legislation does require a service plan as the legislation stands and it provides a significant overarching framework and discipline within which the health service executive presents that to the minister as required so that is the structure as it exists at this point in time with the other objectives that I explained to you, Chair, there. In relation to um, health insurance, perhaps Mr Mulvaney might give some detail on that. On the PCRS, likewise, perhaps we can provide some details to you on the composition of that figure. Um, the private health insurance issue is being examined by the, the Butler Group at this point in time, and there are other significant legal and other issues which uh, do come to bear in relation to that, which are also uh, the subject of consideration by the Health Service Executive and the Department. Um, I think, Deputy, there are the main issues I would like to share with you. Thank you. Deputy, on the PCRS, um, we can set that out, but typically, so that's the variance at the end of August, it was the, the overrun on, on its costs. Um, typically, about 70 to 80 per cent of costs in that area are drug related schemes, the, the various drug related schemes. Um, despite, in fairness to the PCRS, huge work and savings it makes on an ongoing <coughs> basis in the base level costs, it drives. Um, value in terms of uh, the price of drugs and uh, the use of generics and, and biosimilars, um, so we can set that out for you, but typically it's, it's across a range of the schemes, and we can, we can give you some figures on that. I think um, Mr Desmond has covered the health insurance issue. So at its high point, the um, acute hospital income from private insurance was about $630 million. Um, that will be less last year. We haven't actually closed that gap. The service planning process will have to seek to close that gap, but just to be clear, if we have a 100 million problem in, in that area and we close that, that's 100 million euro worth of either cost that has to come from somewhere else or money that can't be invested on something else. So it's not, that gap isn't closed yet. And um, as I said, that is the slot care recommendation and that has been looked at by a group. The implications of that are, you know, more complex than just finding six, the 600 million. They are you know, much broader than that, but we we'll have the group look at that. Um, I think that's it. Yeah. Sure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Deputy Durkin. Thank you, Mr Chairman. As, as it happens, I had to go over to the Chamber uh, to, to deal with a question on the same issue. Uh, you'd be glad to know. But, uh, and this, uh, generally the same answer. I'm, not, I'm, I, I, I'm a bit concerned about uh, some of the answers. I, 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 I feel it is bad budgeting practice to repeatedly fall short of the target on one side or the other unless there's some really serious explanation. For instance, the PCRS, um, drug costs, uh, yes, they can and will impact. Uh, and uh, we need a, counter, a, a counterbalancing uh, a, a, a issue as well, such as reduction in the costs by means of whatever we require, the things we talked about many, many times in this committee, Mr Chairman, using uh, the, the, European, the power of the European Union as, as, as a procurement uh, lever for the purposes of reducing drug costs. And in the course of the year, there are regular instances whereby new drugs come on market and, and cause problems. And obviously there are patients for whom those drugs are, are suitable. Uh, uh, it, I think the practice should be established whereby an immediate assessment is done as to how the budget will be affected there and then, not waiting until the end of the year to say how much of an overrun there is or how much of a surplus there is if, if we were in that situation. I also have a, a worry, uh, Chairman, and as I said before, I've been around the health services for a long time, and I remember the, the health boards, and I remember the overruns during that period, back in as far as the year 2000, and there were overruns. So there has to be a time and place whereby we identify precisely what practice is causing the problem again and again and again, and, ident and deal with it. Because if we don't deal with it, it goes on and on forever, and we'll find somebody will be sitting here in 20 years' time, and we'll be talking about the same thing. Now, I realize that uh, George uh, W. Bush, I think, was the guy who mentioned the known unknowns and the unknown unknowns, and I don't want to go into that too deeply, Mr. Chairman, because uh, I think he wouldn't want us to go into it either. But the point, the point of the issue is this, though. At a certain point, we need to know where these particular uh, bodies are buried, so as to be able to, to circumnavigate our, our budget accordingly. We need also uh, to know more about, for, for instance, the, the question about accommodation, uh, to, to find accommodation for people whose relatives have passed on and who now require accommodation. I'm not so sure that the way 
the HSE deals with that issue is the correct way. For example, I can think of an old uh, Chester, uh, uh, um, Crooksling, Crooksling uh, Nursing Home has a capacity to get for up to 100 people, yet the HSE wants to close it down and it's undermining it, slowly strangling it to bring it down. Now that accommodation is there already, it can't, there's no capital costs involved in it at all. But the HSE has decided we want a different system in a different place. To what benefit? I don't know. I used to be on the visiting committee of that hospital um, many years ago. And it's still structurally sound. Now, somebody would say, of course, an engineer's report would say that that's not true. Well, it is true. It is structurally sound. And uh, there are certain things that even engineers have to have. We have to dispute issues with engineers as well as economists and financial controllers as well. But the point about it is this. There's no use saying on the one hand we have a budgetary overrun and we're providing alternative accommodation where we already have in our position accommodation already built and paid for. So that point, I, w I would like some clarification on that point. And the other one is in relation to... <coughs> um, this thing about the, 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 the greater incidence uh, of, for, 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 for treatment, the ageing population, you know, it's, I, I accept all that. But it has to be possible to budget for it, precisely. Like the, the, the information is already there. So unless that there's, there's some particular issue that we're not told about, uh, we need to, to, to do something about it. The State Claims Agency, Mr Chairman, there's a simple way to deal with that. How does the overruns and the expenditure in the State Agency, how are they monitored? And are they in line with adjoining jurisdictions? It's a simple and straightforward one. If they're not, if they're excessive, below or above, whatever the case may be, then we have to ask questions about it. Why is that? What is the reason for that? The other issue that I refer to is the, the um, uh, private insurance and the reluctance to, to deal with uh, insurance in emergency cases. Or to, 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 uh, I'd like to know a little bit more about that. To my mind, it, it almost looks as if we could be subsidising, the public health sector could well be subsidising the private health sector if we are to assume what I think that means. Now, another issue there, obviously, calls, and, and I, I would say, it must be possible within the public health sector to take, for instance, a hospital and compare it with the private sector, side by side. It has to be possible to make a comparison on a like-for-like -like basis, and before somebody tells me you can't do that on a like-for-like -like basis, it's chalk and cheese or apples and strawberries or whatever the case may be, I don't accept that. It is possible. And it needs to be done. And it needs to be done as a matter of urgency. Because otherwise, we will continue to embarrass ourselves uh, by suggesting, you know, that there's something wrong here that we can't identify on our, that we, we, whatever. And the last point I want to make, Mr. Chairman, is, is my old hobby horse. The chain of command. How it operates within the health services. Where, the, 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 for instance, if a, a consultant wants access to uh, facilities in a theatre, whatever the case may be, uh, or radiography, or whatever, and cannot avail of those services at the time, that's a loss of money, that's a loss of revenue, a potential loss of revenue. If, 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 if you hold up the facilities that are there and, 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 and set them in abeyance for any period of time in the course of a working day, that's a potential loss, a financial loss, a liability on the system. And I would certainly like to see, Mr Chairman, you know, once and for all, that somebody could make an intrusion and identify those uh, uh, blockages that, that, are, that exist. For whatever reason they may well be, and they may well be, expl explain they may be explainable. They might be possible to explain them away. But I haven't heard them explained away yet. And I'm, I'm concerned that we continue on and at this uh, uh, same issue year after year after year and we're no nearer getting to the bottom of it. So those are my questions, Chairman, if I might have an answer. Thank you, Deputy Durkin. Um, Mr Mulvaney or Mr Desmond? Well, there are a number of um, questions that span both agencies, I think, uh, in relation to the State Claims Agency in, in no particular order, Deputy, if that's okay. Um, 
Adjoining jurisdictions may well operate under different legal systems, and we would have to provide some information on comparative uh, awards or how that operates if that is what is requested. But I think we are talking about quite a specific legal context within each area, within each jurisdiction, and we certainly have it here. And it is the unpredictability of a certain component of the likely state agency costs which can cause issues for us, as I explained earlier on. Uh, but I don't have particular data available that I can share with you here, but we can, yeah. certainly, we can certainly inquire for you, Deputy. <coughs> well, I, I, I didn't ask to inquire about it, Chairman. I want to no, know if we can get Absolutely, Deputy. In relation to private insurance of public hospitals, uh, this Lodge Care report did require request the um, establishment of an independent group to examine private practice in public hospitals. That work is ongoing and uh, is, is well advanced at this stage. How long is that work ongoing, Chairman? I'm sorry to interrupt. I don't think it has taken that long to actually... Years. Not quite, no, no. Deputy, no. The Slotch Care report is quite recent in that context. I'm aware of that, but the, 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 the evaluation of the public versus the private and, 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 and the correlation there and the possibility of subsidising one by the other, how long has that issue been in, in the public arena? I think about 10 years. Well, it's an issue of concern and interest for, for, for about 10 years. For a considerable period of time, but in relation to the specific um, recommendation of the Slotch Care report, that work has commenced and that independent group has been working uh, at a significant pace since the establishment uh, post the Sanjay report, which is quite recent, and, and uh, the work of that group continues on uh, apace. Uh, in relation to drugs, pharmaceuticals, there is in built into the system assessment and pharmacoeconomic assessment of significant drug proposals, and that actually takes place at the beginning of uh, a stage where a drug is potentially likely to come onto the market. So it's a very complex area naturally and the subject of a separate medicines management program, um, but it is certainly uh, well established at, at this stage, including the corresponding process of achieving uh, savings through the engagement with the pharmaceutical sector, for example, at the same time from the existing drugs budget. Um, but as I mentioned in my opening statement, there are continuous pressures in certain areas such as high-tech and other drug uh, um, requirements. Well, there are some drug companies, Chairman, at this moment offering similar drugs at a fairly substantially reduced cost to the public health sector. Is that not true? Just Deputy, I think you may be referring to the, um, the fact that the Humira drug is coming off patent and that there was some um, ill-informed media comment on that in recent times. So just to back up what uh, Mr Desmond is saying, the HSE does do a very detailed horizon scanning process so that we are aware of what drugs are in what different stages in the process. There is legislation which covers this, the 2013 Act, and we are ready um, subject to getting applications which we've started to get from uh, biosimilar suppliers. Uh, we are ready subject to them having stock to have those approved from the 1st of November and we're satisfied nobody would have had stock in the country before the 1st of November. So the HSE's processes, um, complex as they are because it's a complex area governed by legislation, have been accelerated to make sure that as soon as stock is available and the appropriate applications are made, which is in process, we can give approval and will give approval for biosimilar drugs which bring a substantial cost reduction as and from the 1st of November. Now, it's, it's unfortunate that the journalists who wrote about this didn't seek input from the HSE in advance of writing about this, but that's the fact. Oh, sorry, Chairman, I didn't get that. It's unfortunate that they didn't seek comment from the HSE in advance of publishing that article. Um, but the, the, I, I don't know the name of the journalist, but there, was a, there has been media comment about <coughs> indicating that the HSE was going to lose substantial savings because it wasn't ready for a particular drug coming off patent and, and being available in the bio, you know, having a biosimilar available for it. That isn't true. The HSC will be available from the 1st of November and those approvals will be in place subject to the biosimilar suppliers having stock and having made the necessary applications, some of which have already started. Thank you, Mr Mulvaney. We're now going to ask Kate, Mr. Chairman. Kate O'Connell. Sir, uh, have you some questions unanswered? Oh, hold on, I don't answer the residential places, for instance. And you that the, uh, <laughs> I don't have specific information about Crooksling. Um, I did mention in my opening statement that there, at, at, of the deficit at the end of um, August, about 15 million of it relates to public long term residential facil facilities, some of which have cost levels which are well above 
uh, other public units and also well above the private units. And while, while there may not be direct comparability between those two, that is something we are um, obviously interested in. So I'm not commenting specifically on Cruxling, but that challenge of being able to get sufficient occupancy of the beds, comply with HICWA registration requirements, which in some cases requires us to reduce the number of beds in existing facilities, and then being able to staff those facilities appropriately with the right skill mix and not having to incur, as we are in a number of places, substantial agency and overtime costs. That is another one of the factors which, in this year's service planning process, looking into next year, we're going to have to look carefully at, because that overrun of 15 million could perhaps be better uh, served investing elsewhere. So I'm not commenting about Crooksling. I don't know whether, where it features in this particular uh, discussion, but that's, that's the bigger picture around direct provision of long-term elderly care versus private provision. Thank you, Mr. Mulvaney. Now, um, can we ask Deputy Kate O'Connell, please? Thank you. Um, just um, <coughs> I understood from previous briefings that the, whichever journalist it was had published a story about Humira in recent days hadn't sought comment from us. I now understand that, that the individual had, and we had, weren't in a position to provide it in time. So I'd like to withdraw that comment, if I could, uh, just to correct that record. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Uh, Deputy O'Connell. Thank you. Um, Mr Mervani, you, just, you spoke there um, about when, when Deputy Jackson was asking about the price of the orphan drugs or the high-tech drugs, um, about the robust assessment um, that happens, I assume we're talking about through the National Centre for Pharmacoeconomics, um, and that's all good and everything. But there is um, scope there for a minister to override the economic decision of that group. Aren't I correct in saying that? The minister can. So if the quality comes back as not being value for money, the minister can override the decision of the NCP. I, I'd say a couple of things, Deputy. Um, the Minister has powers in this area, yeah. the specifics of which my colleagues can, can talk about. The NCPE that you mentioned, the National Centre for Farm Economics, is part of the overall process, mm -hmm. but the process is run inside the HSE, and the HSE has a drugs committee, uh, and it will engage the NCTP to do those health technology assessments. The, um, that process uh, is quite exhaustive. There are, I think, 13 grounds mm -hmm. that the 2013 legislation requires us to look at. And no, the decision isn't made solely on the, uh, the, the, actual, the quality number mm -hmm. or the, 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 the sums. There are some drugs, and again, I'm speaking about an area that you know far more than I do, there are some drugs which might never meet those uh, simple quality thresholds, the quality of life adjusted years. Um, so, and, and, and the decisions around those get more and more difficult and more and more challenging. So, um, we ourselves will at times approve, uh, we being the HC leadership team, based on recommendations from our drug committee can approve and have approved in the past um, drugs that go beyond the standard quality thresholds for various reasons. And then no doubt the Minister has capacity in this area as well. I suppose really what I'm getting at is I know that in the UK where there is perhaps pressure or the, the quality doesn't come in as it's been approved, that they often um, allow 18 months or two years of a treatment period with a, a new drug and then for the patient to be assessed thereafter. So you're not just given it and let go continuously that if there, it's a high price drug that you're reassessed to see what impact it's having on your condition. I suppose where I'm going with this is that I have reason to believe that there is some data coming out for a particular drug which I'm not prepared to say here that was approved um, last year that the, the outcomes, it doesn't seem like as good a value for money that has was being portrayed perhaps in the AV room or whatever. So I'm just wondering about how do you put an it's very hard to take something off somebody. So how do you how do you how do you stem the flow? So if patient X gets orphan drug that's supposed to help them, but in two years we're still paying for it, and there's the doctor decides there's no clinical indication to continue, have you built in a system of saying no? So, Deputy, as you can imagine, for some people uh, who might be watching this, uh, it's very difficult to talk about money and life-saving drugs and having to restrict them. You know, yeah, but we are here discussing income no, with no, the no, HSE, no, so it seems reasonable. Absolutely, Deputy, absolutely. But, but I'm just, kind of just, just to say that, so um, if, if 
if an individual's child was told that this drug would sort their problem and, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, no amount of money would, would be an issue. So um, in, against that background, the HSE's um, drugs approval process, governed by legislation, is extensive and uh, does seek to be very balanced. And where it is necessary, uh, we don't approve drugs. We approve certain drugs only when the price is lowered. I know all this, but what my but question I, specifically is, question, you know what my question, my question is, when you initiate somebody, a child or adult, on an expensive high-tech or orphan drug, that perhaps the sum doesn't add up, but a decision is made to give it, have you any way of pulling back from that decision if the therapy isn't giving bang for a buck? So apologies, so I was coming to your question. So the, um, in some of the uh, approvals that are granted, uh, the access is restricted to a certain protocol driven access. And in some cases, we place a cap on the actual level of resource, um, depending on what are the subsequent efficacy results. Um, I'm now, I'm now beyond my level of knowledge as to whether we can ever, for an individual patient, take, you know, cease reimbursing an individual patient. So I won't comment on that, I'll, I'll get you an answer to that question. Yeah, but we I, do I am aware that in the UK, one of the ways they deal with this is they say, right, you can have it, but you should be seeing an outcome as per trials, and we'll give you it, but if you're not getting the results, Sorry, we can't be spending 100,000 a month on an injection or whatever. So I get you an answer to that yeah. specific question yeah. outside of yeah. the camp. Because I did bring it up here some time ago. Um, do we know, and perhaps someone asked this when I was absent, um, do we know where we stand now with the 17 billion spend on health? Plus, what's our income from the private? I remember from Sound Care, it was about 5 billion at the time. Is it still 5 billion that the private is? funding into the public? What's the total? The, the um, acute hospital income yeah. at its height was about 630 million and what we said earlier and looking forward to the year end we would see a problem of about 90 to 100 million in that area due to the actions of insurers in terms of uh, encouraging their members not to use their yeah, yeah. insurance going to ED and so on. Half a billion then? No, no, sorry, it's, it, yeah, it's, it's about half a billion, not, not five. Yeah. And how do we stand now in terms of the OECD? Are we the highest spend? I think we were the second or third last year. Are we, are we top of the list now per capita? Minister? No, I think the US, the US will never be knocked off that list. So oh, we we're about fifth or sixth, it depends, um, Deputy, on the per capita. Now, can I, can I just make a comment, Deputy, that the, um, the most important thing about those uh, OECD figures are getting to the point where there's a kind of an understanding as to, you know, are they indicating that the resource level and health for the outputs is too high or not? Now, you won't want to listen to me talk about this necessarily, but most of the commentators, including the Aroxas' own Library and Research Service, have urged caution as to how we use those figures. Um, the per capita figures may be more reliable than the GDP figures. We know the GDP figures flatter Ireland, perhaps, because we talk about gross national income, uh, modified GN, and, and, and so on and so forth. So there are lots of statistics there which place Ireland in different rankings. Some of them towards the top, for fifth or sixth or seventh in OECD. There's also a statistic which says in 2016 that if you look at the rate of growth in public health care spend, spend over the OECD from something like 2000 and uh, I think it's 8 to 2017, Ireland is at 0.8% and therefore 32nd in the OECD. Now, does that counteract all the other arguments? I don't know, but I would urge caution. It's not figures. as clear as, because we're it's giving not different as clear, things. And there are specific reasons acknowledged by the likes of the OECD and our own CSO, such as the fact that we, we tend to report about the 3.5 to 4 billion in social care spending, disability and elderly, and there is a lack of certainty as to whether all other countries who are counted in those figures report that in the same way. So there are other issues like that. So I'm not saying it means that the figures are wrong. I'm just saying, as I think Professor Ren and DSRI said, you'd want to be careful about making policy decisions based on which particular ranking we are against OECD GDP or um, uh, pushing price parity. So just to say that. And then the state claims agency, the, the spend has rapidly increased. Is, 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 is that, in your view, just due to a more litigious um, society? Or is it a case um, that, due to the recruitment issues in the health service, which we've heard here at length, 
um, from various people, um, from the doctors as well as people within the HSC, that often where a post is advertised back in the day, you'd have um, six or seven eminent people applying for a job. And now, or in the last 10 years, we've often had positions where one or two people applying for a job and they're not the people you ever would have given it to them in the past or whatever. They're, they're qualified, but there's not the competition there. Is the, um, the exodus of our professional trained staff and the reliance on locums and agency staff, do you think that's contributing to the increase in claims? Deputy, just answer the question. I've asked the State Claims Agency on a number of occasions, and they, they'll be here, I'm sure, in due course, um, whether the significant growth in our reimbursement of them over the last number of years is driven by, let's say, the incidence of claims, in other words, what we're doing around practice, or is it driven more by the operation of the legal system and how all that process works? Yep. The answer has always been the latter, that it is how the legal process is operating, and rather than the incidence level. So the um, lawyers are getting more money, um, rather one, than... One way to characterise it, Deputy. <coughs> the money's um, going there. But when I ask, I mean, the, the biggest single driver is catastrophic obstetric cases. Mm -hmm. And when, when we ask whether our levels of those cases are outside international norms, we're told no. So the answer I've always been given is that it is more to do with how the overall claims and legal process operates, as opposed to the underlying healthcare issue. And now, when you look at the catastrophic claims, do you divide it down into specialities? So do you divide it into psychiatric, maternity? I'd imagine our catastrophic instances of maternity are higher than maternity-related catastrophic. That is the single biggest area by by far. Now, just to say, Deputy, that does not mean that there aren't quality and risk issues within the health service that we have to attend to and work on on a constant basis. And it doesn't mean that you're wrong in terms of there have been increasing levels of challenge in certain specialities in recruiting uh, consultants. I'm just not drawing a link between that and the state claims agency figures. So you're not saying that there isn't a link? Um, just and finally, on the demographic pressures which, um, which Deputy Durkin brought up, I, it's, this, it always seems to be like a surprise that people are living longer and then that this sort of inference that they're costing us a load of money and it's all their fault when we're the ones that kept them alive. Um, surely, has someone done a, a, a quantitative analysis on this? Because I'm, I'm just assuming that if you give the 65-year-old more tablets and that stops them ending up on in hospital or an inpatient or in acute care, that obviously it's better to have people alive at home on tablets than occupying an acute bed. So has an analysis actually been done on the price of keeping people alive over 70? Have we done that some? I get the value to those, you know, yeah. the, the exchequer value of them, you know, it, it just seems it's thrown out easily, oh, they're costing a fortune. And Debbie, we, we would never say in a negative way that the um, fact that people are living longer um, I'm not saying it's a bad constantly thing. thrown out as a reason or oh, demographic pressures. So, you know? Deb, if your question is, is it possible to forecast uh, increasing demographics, of course it is. Do we forecast increasing demographics and the impact that will have on, on activity and cost? Yes, we do. Um, do we know how many additional what we call complexity weighted units can be caused by simply, even if the same number of beds has people who are a year old or going into them, yes we can. So that information at a relatively broad level is available. What, what our commentary analysis is acknowledging is the fact that that ongoing ageing of the population does inevitably, albeit it's a positive thing, drive additional cost. It drives additional complexity. It means you have older, more vulnerable people in hospitals and other healthcare facilities. They're therefore more um, open to, you know, infection and other, and other issues. So uh, it, it does mean, oh, it can mean longer lengths of stay and so on and so forth. So it's just a reality, a positive reality, unfortunately. Of a yeah, but surely it would be balanced from a budgetary point of view by people, you know, living healthier lifestyles and perhaps not turning up as, as young with type 2 diabetes. So it will balance, <coughs> you know, it, it, keeping it may, people it, alive longer, but also people not entering the health service and requiring... Over time, over time, it over should. time, potentially, Deputy. If, if the model of care, I mean, the model of care we have today is the model of care, broadly speaking, give us some adjustments you'll have in 14 months' time. So it's it's the cost of that model of care that is the issue in any year that you're planning. 
you would also then do longer term planning, such as through this launch care process, to say, well, we want a completely different model of care, but you won't turn around the model of care, obviously, in 14 months. So, um, while people living healthier lifestyles is absolutely the way to go, um, what we're faced with is, is treating the people who are in front of us now, or who want to be in front of us now, and in 14 months' time, broadly the same model of care, albeit with some adjustments, will be what's costing in, the, in that period, you know. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Deputy O'Connell. So we're going to go um, back to Deputy Donnelly. Thanks, Chair. Um, I want to touch, if I can, on, um, on accountability. There's a lot of talk of uh, clinicians being held to account. Um, certainly, within the private sector, if you had a multi-billion euro organisation and the board was reported to every year by the chief executive and his or her team and they were overspending by six, seven hundred million a year and that didn't stop, the chief exec would be fired and his or her financial team would be fired. That's what, that's what would happen. Um, can I ask, given that the overspend has been in excess of half a billion a year for the last five years, has anyone within the department or within the HSC lost their job due to these ongoing annual massive uh, overspends? Simple answer to that question, definitely no. Is that the same in the department? Well, to my knowledge, no. Um, has anyone uh, been sanctioned, formally sanctioned, ever for any of these overruns? So, definitely, the, the accountability process that we have does have the potential for sanction, and the sanction can be up to and including uh, disciplinary action. It doesn't start there. Obviously, accountability is about being responsible. For no, no, I, 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 no, for I, I understand the concept of accountability. I'm, I'm asking a, a direct question, which is: Have any formal sanctions of any kind ever been taken against any member of the HSE or the department for these overruns? So we have issued performance notices, and we have escalated services and their teams around their performance. Have we sanctioned an individual? and imposed a disciplinary sanction on an individual. Um, I feel the need to avoid just giving simply yes or no, because that's, a, that's, a, that's not a simple question, Deputy, but the, the, the factual answer is a short no. The implied question behind it as to whether they should have been is a much longer discussion, which I'm, I'm, I'm happy to have. But there is no simple, um, you're fired, uh, due to or or, or you're sanctioned. There's been no formal sanction taken. If, if by sanction you mean some period of suspension or something anything, of, that, of that personal anything, nature. Anything. Anything formal. Uh, uh, demotion, um, suspension, uh, formal performance management uh, that would lead potentially to losing your job over time, fired, uh, cut in wages, anything. Has any formal sanction been taken against any member of staff? Not on, a, not on an individual staff member basis, but as I said, we have put um, services through escalation processes and required um, improvement plans, and you know, followed up on those improvement plans. Ah, yeah, that's all fine. Yeah, I, yeah, but that's, that's his that, is the, that is the necessary part of any accountability and performance management process. Yes, but has it, it led to this reaction? No. Okay. Didn't. So, can I ask you to reflect on that? Because if you have an entire system that overspends by vast amounts of money every year and didn't always do it, but does now, and no one ever loses their job, and no one is ever sanctioned in any way for this, um, you're not really sending out the right signal in terms of this, this, this having to end, because this has changed. Brendan Drum wrote an open letter to the Irish Times pointing out that in his tenure between 2005 and 2010, the HSE operated within budget except when the government of the day announced new initiatives in that year to be launched. And so the, the, the spending beyond the, the allocated budget was for new initiatives. But, but the budget as allocated for the services under the plan were met. <coughs> now we've moved to a situation where it's become normal that the HSE overspends by six or seven hundred million euro. euro. You've said no provisioning is, is done. 
Um, so you, you, you might just reflect on that. Can I ask you over the last few years, at the start of the year, so we, we have overruns now between five and seven hundred million euro over the last five years. At the start of the year, did you believe that the budgets would be met, that the HSE would operate within budget? For both of you, yeah. The budget for the year was set in accordance with what the government allocated. The, it is a requirement of the HSE to deliver the service plan within that allocation, and obviously significant choices are made, therefore, as to how to cover the full range of services there that need to be provided and funded, as Mr Mulvaney was outlining earlier on in the hearing. And within that, necessarily, there is a management process throughout the year to ensure that, as much as possible, those services are provided within the overall allocation provided by the government. Plus, as I mentioned earlier on, the efficiencies which necessarily should be a part of any service going forward are also built into the system. And while they were ambitious this year, they do set a basis for how this might be approached in future years. So it is a very challenging area to actually provide the required funding for the services available, for the services required, and also take account of the unforeseen um, issues that I mentioned in the opening statement. I don't know if that actually answers the question you're, you're speaking No, to. it doesn't. The question I'm asking is, at the start, so over the last five years, <coughs> The health overspend has been between 500 million and 700 million. <coughs> Did you think, at the start of each of those five years, or any of those five years, that you were actually going to come in on budget? Well, that, if, I, if I could answer that question, I mean, what what we thought about the the year ahead is what's set out in the service plan, and as Mr. Desmond has said, there's certain kind of legal parameters around that. We have sought in each year to be as clear as practical about what are the risks in delivering of the service plan and um, and then we engage and we report on that. And we're, we're very, very clear, Deputy, that our job is to provide the maximum amount of safe services, to try to have a continually a kind of a sustainable improvement in those services and to do that within the resources available. Now, um, we have not managed to do that for a number of years at a significant, a significant level, and that's acknowledged, that, that, that's, that's a fact. Um, the, and, and again, I'm not saying you're doing it, but the, 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 the analogy with the private sector, there is very significant evidence that says the whole authorisation environment around the public sector is not the same as the private sector. I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not asking you the public or the private sector. I'm asking you a very simple question. Well, no, okay, just finish, at, at, at the start, you mentioned the, you know, nobody being fired and you, you'd fired the CFO team. And look, I serve the pleasure of the Director General. It's a matter for himself if, mm. if, uh, if he wants me to do this or not. But the, the analogy is not straightforward. And if I could say, and again, I'm not trying to drag other departments into it, the HSE, while ours is always the biggest because we are practically the biggest vote, in percentage terms, the HSE is not number one or number two, and in some cases not number three or four, in recent years in terms of its requirement for supplementary estimates. Now, each of those will have individual reasons that you have to go through what was in control, what was not, what's a performance issue versus what is not. They all have to be looked at specifically in recent Ms. years. Mr. Mulvaney, sorry, just in the interest of time, I understand that. that That's not addressing the question I'm asking you. The question I'm asking you is, each year for the last five years, at the start of the year, did you think that you were going to come in on budget for that year? And the answer, Deputy, is what we thought was what was set out in the service plan. If the risks that were set out could all be managed, yes, we could. No, no, I'm, I'm not looking for ifs. I'm, not, I'm, I'm asking you as, the, as the, the Chief Financial Officer and, and, and Mr Desmond Jew as, the, as, as one of the, the senior officials within the department. Was it your view in the round, given the risks, given the complexity, was it your view at the start of the year that you would come in on budget in each of the, the last five years? I've answered the question, Deputy, the only way I can. You, you My haven't, view though. what's set out in that service plan and the, the, and the company that has to go with it. Um, I, I, don't have a, I don't have a different answer to give you. You can give me a yes or a no answer. It's, it's binary. You either thought you were going to come in on budget or you didn't. No, I, I think, to be, to be frank, Deputy, this issue is much more complex than that. And, um, no, so Mr. Mr. So Mr. Valley, sorry, sorry, no, sorry. With the, with the greatest respect, it's not. 
any CFO handing a board or a chief executive a budget at the start of the year has a view as to whether or not that budget, they believe that that budget is going to be met. It is pretty binary. And any chair of any board will ask the CFO, do you believe that this is a reasonable budget and that we are going to come in on budget? I'm simply asking you, if you believed on the 1st of January of this year, whether or not you thought we were likely to come in on budget. And Deputy, I've answered your question in the best way I can. I don't have a different answer to give you. Okay. With, with respect, I don't think you're answering the question. And, and it's for some. Yeah, okay. Um, on savings, obviously there was a, what appears to be a, a, a made-up number, the 347 million, which I, I think 60 of it can be accounted for in terms of targeted savings. Um, there appear to be savings opportunity all over the system. Uh, for example, I spoke with a, a, uh, a senior consultant recently who prescribes very expensive drugs who produced a paper that said they could change their, their, um, their work and save about five million on the prescribing that was being done, but he couldn't get anyone from either the department or the HSC to meet him and, and, uh, and take it seriously. I'm seeing examples of savings all over the system all the time, um, and examples of process improvements which ultimately lead to savings. So Tala Hospital, for example, the, uh, the clinicians there wanted to bring in a triage room, standard practice in emergency medicine. It took them five years to get the room commissioned, which obviously has, in the first instance, patient safety issues, but in the second instance, what we're talking about today, uh, fund funding issues, because there, because there are missed savings. What is being done to try and tap into the, the people on the ground, the administrators, the doctors, the nurses, the hospital porters, the hospital managers, because most hospitals I visit, most wards I visit, most emergency departments I visit, they can literally point me to cost savings, but they say there's no one is listening to them and they can't get anything through. What is being done to try and change that? So, that the, the, um, on a specific example of a consultant who feels that he or she can make a saving, um, if, if there's some detail we can share on that, we, we, we certainly seek to track that down. Um, the HSE is trying to promote a kind of a, a culture which um, a allows people to interact around some of these issues because some of it is a kind of a it's a culture thing about values, not value for money, but just about values. And you know, are the different parts of, of the team in a hospital all able to kind of speak frankly to each other, whether you're the, the cleaner or the porter or the, or the consultant? So there's there's a piece around that and how you kind of change that and change it over time. And there is work um, on the way around that. There is a, a values and action program, which as I said, it's not about money, it's about kind of the overall culture. The, um, there is a reality around different people have different views of what a saving is, if you know what I mean. So there are savings which are simply take cash out, and there are savings which are valuable, but what they mean is you can get extra for less than it would normally cost marginally extra. That actually, some of those will actually grow your cost. Um, I totally take the point that you must pursue the stuff that is safety or quality driven. Anyway, that has, that, that, that has to happen. So I'd also say that the value improvement programme, which we are going to uh, continue it, we do need to energise it more, that's, that's, that's totally accepted. That was, and it's clearly set out in the service plan, that was seeking to identify additional levels of saving. Beyond the savings that our system generates on an ongoing basis, all around the country, at hospital level, at ward level, and uh, in the community, and in, in uh, psychiatry and so on. Uh, not all of which we can capture or, or cost or actually measure or report. So part of our system is continuously um, making improvements. Um, out at that individual uh, team level, and, and that, is, that, that is something to be encouraged. We can't report on all of that, and some of that gets swallowed up because something else happens and costs grow, and they're, they're, they're neither funded for one uh, nor the other, perhaps. So we have a substantial um, amount of work to do around trying to develop savings initiatives and promote them. But there are significant savings already been 
driven in parts of the, the health service. The 60 million that we'll get this year on value improvement is not insignificant. It's a problem when you compare it with the, with the overall target that's accepted. Um, there are hundreds of millions of euros of savings being delivered by our primary care reimbursement service every year in order to try and contain drug costs so that we can allow more new drugs in um, that, are, that are needed. Um, those savings are built into the base, their targets are driven by the base, so they don't actually close any of the gaps. So, it, we'd be wrong to say that there's only 60 million worth of savings going on at the moment in okay. the health service. The issue Thanks. is capturing and reporting on some of it. Thank you. Final question. Um, do you think, I want to go back to the, to the overspend. Um, as far as I can see, there is, a, there is a serious governance issue with this. Do you think that the disbanding of the HSE board will have contributed to um, these overspends? If I can answer, um, without going back to the history as to the disbandment of the HC board at that time, and uh, say I wasn't in this post at that time, it was a recommendation of Sancho Care that there should be a board put in place and the governance legislation for that purpose is in the Oireachtas at the moment. So there is a recognition that governance within the HC and accountability is an ongoing process and in any complex area. Uh, which isn't, with respect, as straightforward as perhaps the private sector with the same degree, uh, a slightly more limited set of parameters in some cases. Um, there is an acceptance that it is an ongoing process that needs to be continuously uh, kept on top of. And for that purpose, uh, a board is being re-established, a chairperson of the board has been appointed, and the process is continuing on at a very... Um, fast pace at this point in time. So, I mean, various approaches have been uh, taken over the years in terms of the delivery of health services and what the appropriate structure is at the top of the health sector. And uh, I think we simply would say that regardless of the history, which I can't comment on, Deputy, um, this is where we stand at this point in time and the recognition is there of, of the need to continue to reform, improve and deepen the accountability and governance structures within the HSE and the health sector generally. Thanks. And Ms. Mulvaney, do you have a view as to whether or not the disbandment of the board may have contributed to the escalation in overspends? I don't have because I wouldn't want to be commenting on policy, but the, uh, the, the senior leadership team of the HSE didn't propose the abolition of the board. Yeah. And, were, um, were you there? Uh, I was. Yeah, so just, I'm not asking you to comment on, on, on policy. I'm asking you as the, 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 the chief financial officer, and maybe you were or weren't at the time, I, I don't know. But for the, from the HSE's perspective, um, did the absence of a board, um, I'm not asking you to comment on whether or not it was the right call, but specifically to what we're trying to understand, which is this escalation in overspends. So would you, would I, you I say make, that? Yeah, I can't answer your question. I can't make any direct correlation yeah. from one to the other. Yeah. Um, and don't forget the purpose of a board is to operate both internally, in other words, to face down into the organisation, and also to operate externally. Um, so would, it have been, would things have been different across a number of fronts had we had a board? I'm sure they would. Would that have been better? Well, government policy is that we should have a board, and therefore um, that seems to be appropriate. Um, uh, too much further than I'm going to be end up commenting okay. on. That's all right. Policy. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. And Mr Mulvaney, just to go back to um, savings, I have been approached by a number of people who have saving ideas, saving plans which they have costed. Uh, one in particular is in relation to um, transplant uh, procedures, hematological transplant procedures in Crumlin. And they, there's about 30 children who require transplant every year. Crumlin can provide 15, and 15 go abroad. But the cost of those going abroad is double the cost of providing the service in Crumlin. So if somebody has an idea like that, because the budget comes out of the um, treatment abroad scheme, which is a separate budget, to the budget going to, the, to Crumlin. Mm -hmm. So the saving can be made, but it's in a separate budgetary category. So if somebody has an idea like that, is there a, a single point of contact that they can approach in the HSE to discuss their idea? In the, in the same way Colin Burke referred to um, hemochromatosis services and GPs could provide it at a fraction of the cost of it being provided in the hospital. So h how do people with ideas specifically in relation to saving make contact with the HSE? So, Chair, if you take the example of um, Crumlin Hospital, 
obviously Crumlin Hospital is in the Children's Hospital Group, and the Children's Hospital Group have a, has a, both a clinical director and, a, and a, a CEO, who and the CEO reports directly to our head of acute operations. So there's not a long leap there. So um, certainly, if anyone has specific proposals they want to share with me, I can assist in pointing them to the right in the right direction. But generally speaking, the route is well known. Um, there's a hospital CEO uh, for Crumlin. There's a group CEO, and there's a national director for acute operations, and that tends to be the route to which uh, these things go. The challenge about it being a different um, budgetary line is it's just a challenge we have to face. If there are real savings there, I think we have to look at them. So again, people's definition of what a saving is tends to vary, but that said, um, so I, I'd suggest they could use any one of those lines, their own CEO, the hospital group, uh, or indeed the national director, who would be often communicated with um, directly. Um, I think we can take it through that process, or as I'm quite happy to assist if people want to communicate with me directly, and I can point to the right part of the organisation. Chair, on a, slightly, on a slightly higher level, I mean, the HC and the department are agreed at the capacity for savings in the whole area of pharma and uh, technology, health technology, and it is something that has potential for savings next year, with the potential there may be certain costs needed to be triggered to trigger certain savings, but certainly that is something that will be, is being pursued actively in the framing of the service plan. For, for next year, so it is something that we we yes. certainly agree. Your your question tends to relate to specific ideas that have come to the notice of the committee. That's fair enough. There really should be a means by which they can come up through the system. Um, it wouldn't be for want of the expertise within the system not realising the benefit and making their best of, of such proposals, for example, and having considered them perhaps previously or may see other aspects to them that may or may not be uh, as clear-cut as might be presented. But certainly the capacity for savings in this area is well recognised. Thank you. Deputy O'Reilly. Thanks very much, Chair. Um, and I'll try and be as brief as I can. Uh, with, a reference was made to uh, when Dr. Brendan Drum uh, was, was in charge of the, the health service, but uh, and the, whether or not there may or may not have been overruns at that time. But that period also, if memory serves me correctly, coincided with the. And I'm not in any way defending uh, Brendan Drum, by the way. But uh, that coincided with the imposition of the moratorium. Would that be around about the same time? 2007, I think that was. Yeah, so it was, it was 05 to 2010. Yeah, no, I, I thought that I was just, just trying to get that clear in my own head. Um, I did reference earlier the funded workforce plan for um, the general funded workforce plan, but the specific one for nurses and midwives, um, when I nipped out there, I, I had a quick check on it. And it's been twice to the WRC and now it's going to the court. And I, I really want to emphasise that that's the funded work, workforce plan for 2018. And we're near November. And we all know that you can't really easily get a date for the Labour Court unless you're about to ground a whole load of planes. Uh, so it is unlikely. I mean, if we are going to be talking about controlling costs and value for money, if you don't have a funded workforce plan for the single biggest grade within the health service at this point in the proceedings, then, I mean, that, that figure... Um, of 300 and, 346, that, that's, that, that was never likely to be achieved because there's no plan in place for how many staff, so therefore there's no capacity to control agency staff um, or overtime or any of the other things that have to be done to, to make up the shortfall. So would you not agree that the funded workforce plan and the, the, the workforce plan for all grades, groups and categories um, should be agreed at some point, like we should be talking now about the plan for 2019, not in November talking about the plan for 2018. It, it, it does strike me a little bit like there's not a huge amount of forward planning um, going into going into this. Just also with regard to the the um, savings figure, was some of that earmarked for savings um, or for a contribution, or some of it to be offset for, by a contribution from uh, the stretch income targets? Uh, we considered those uh, previously, and I know that uh, it was brought to our attention by the uh, chief executive, I think, of one of the hospital groups. I, I don't, don't quote me on that because I, I can't remember exactly who it was, but it was in a submission that was made to us that... Um, individual hospitals and hospital groups were being given t 
targets uh, to harvest money from, or collect money rather, from private um, and from, from private sources, and I'm assuming health insurance and whatever else, but that they had added stretch targets to that. So if the target was five million, you know, the, it, it was stretched out by a certain percentage. Can, do you still do that? Are you still putting that uh, requirement on so, so chief executives? A couple of things. Um, we haven't increased the income target from private maintenance income. That's the target that gets set for all the hospitals mm. in the last two years, I think. Um, partly because it wouldn't be prudent to do so, given the yeah. uh, difficulties we're having with private insurers and their, their, their campaigns and their other actions. Um, it's important to, to also say that the once the private income charge is a, a legislation-based yeah. charge, once somebody is um, covered by the charge, that the hospital has to levy it and the hospital has to pursue it. No, I'm not talking about the, the actual charge, and I'm aware of that. I'm talking about stretch income targets, a target versus a figure. See, the, there is, a, and there is a difference. I mean, you, you'll know that there is a difference between um, collecting all the money, which of course uh, you have to do. You're, you're obliged to do that, and that's separate. But setting a target for the amount of money, because that uh, that to me causes a problem with regard to how you're going to plan, because you do have. Uh, you know, you have an incentive, a, a very bizarre incentive, to be um, imposed. I believe imposed by uh, by public servants imposing a a target on other public servants to collect money out of the private sector. Um, and if those stretch income targets are still in place, um, Mr. Mulvaney, I would be worried. Uh, I'd be worried because I don't think it, it's it's a prudent way to plan. Uh, I'd be worried, you know, for all sorts of other reasons, which we won't go into here. But if you're saying that the targets have been met for the last, or haven't changed for the last two years, well, then I can only assume they do include the stretch income targets, because when we reviewed this, it was less than a year ago, and the stretch income targets were in it. So if you're aiming to hit uh, a figure of savings and you're massively wide of the mark, which is our um, then counting in the stretch income targets into that figure. And again, it, com it comes back to that you haven't been able to provide an explanation as to where that figure came from, and that's very worrying. But if stretch income targets are, are part of it, is it not around about time that you maybe acknowledge that that's not working and um, perhaps try and figure out another way? And just very briefly, because I, I know time is tight, um, Going back uh, over a number of years, there were various initiatives that took place, um, and actually uh, Brendan Drum was one person who initiated them, and it was a, a conversation with staff, and we spent a, a long number of uh, days above in, in government buildings where they, they let us have the use of one of the rooms, and people came in and out and in and out, health service workers, and they talked about uh, just on the ground savings. I mean, I mean, that was around the time that the moratorium was imposed, and uh, just how re a lot of it very simple stuff, but how they envisaged that simple changes could be made. Uh, you know, I'm not even talking about the big stuff, not the out of control agency bill, not the privatisation, not that stuff, but small, uh, small things that could be achieved at the level of the ward or the primary care centre, and, and suggestions were made by staff. Um, that was never followed up on, never. Um, but it might be something that you would consider in the context of a plan to actually ensure that it was followed up on. And I don't think it's feasible if a, if a staff nurse working in Letterkenny has an idea for how she might improve uh, you know, how the ward is run. Because we all have an idea to get, get more staff in and we won't have to deal with constant crises. But if he or she has an idea or if there's a porter in Tala who has an idea, how could they realistically feed that idea in uh, and how would it be taken on board because the the top down approach was tried and, and with respect failed so i don't know would you maybe reflect on that and, and perhaps consult with the, the representative organizations because i know that there are many people who have good ideas um where i mean the target's quite ambitious you, you've just admitted that yourself um but you might need all all hands to the pump you've missed it for this year but there, there's always next year i suppose thanks sir. so deputy, thank you deputy Riley. on the question of um would we reflect and consider on better ways to engage with staff at, at the at the coal phase around what savings are practical 
Uh, that sounds very sensible. And to the extent that hospitals and community services are not already doing that, that's something I'd be happy to take away. The stretch income targets, and maybe it's just a language thing, but the point I'm trying to get across is the, there's an obligation to levy the charge once uh, the individual meets certain criteria. So it's not as if people should be levying a charge in some way that's uh, a stretch. Their, their, their task is to levy the charge where, when, it, when it's appropriate to do it. When I said that we haven't changed the target, what I mean is that the 346 million isn't dependent on somebody achieving a stretched target. And if we were to lower the income targets, in fact, you'd have to find more uh, savings because the income targets mm -hmm. and the income that they raise supports the cost of providing the service. Now, yeah, well, it's not the income targets, though, Stephen. It's the stretch. It's the it, these are your targets, and then the imposition of stretch income targets. And that, to me, goes beyond the simple. If you have a private patient, you levy, levy that private patient. Of course, you do. Um, and it does lead to a situation whereby, if you have two patients in accident and emergency. One bed, one both similar levels of acuity. One has private health insurance, the other one doesn't. There is a perverse incentive where you have two identical patients. There is a perverse incentive for the private, the, the one with private health insurance or a means to pay privately to go into that bed ahead because simply the stretch income target will then be met. This is not about whether or not people are collecting money at local level. That money is being collected. This is about the setting of targets and then the stretching of those income targets, which does create a perverse incentive to people to uh, prioritise. And I'm not suggesting that clinicians do it on any basis other than clinically, but in a situation where you had two people, both with the same level of acuity and one bed, there is a perverse incentive that has been created by the finance side of the house for uh, people on the other side of the house to give that bed in that scenario to the patient who has the private health insurance. And I believe that is fundamentally wrong. And if that figure forms part of your 346, well, then it is absolutely no surprise to me that you were massively wide of the mark to achieve that. So I could just say, um, Deputy, a couple of things. So the, uh, as we know, the charge is set in legislation. Whether or not we should have such charges or not is a matter for policy. The Slaunch Care Report indicates a potential change in that policy and has been worked through. Um, so I'm not giving you my personal view on the charge or not. R regardless of the notion of stress charge, maybe we just have to agree to differ, differ on that. Once you have any charge, there is a potential, all other things being equal, for the private patient to get into the public room. Now, the really important thing to stress is public, in other words, single rooms, which is really what we're talking about here, single rooms are always clinically prioritised first for things like infection control and other good reasons. But if all other things are genuinely the same, particularly clinically genuinely the same, yes, the private patient will get the option to go into the single room um, ahead of somebody else. And that is the impact of the legislation and the policy, because we are operating a system where we're charging. Bounded by certain targets. No, this, the, this is not, it, but it, it is, Stephen, of no, course it is. But definitely there's a target for everything. A target is just a forecast. But this is a some, stretch target. Well, this see, that, is the, what you have been told you have to collect on, on top of that, an additional target. I, I struggle with the stretch piece as to what that actually means, to be honest, Deputy. But it came um, in a submission from the HSE. You shouldn't struggle with it. But maybe, I, maybe I'll, I'll go and check what, what that submission well, was. You, you can talk to Liam Woods. He was here. We spoke about it. It's, it I'll, I'll remind myself, Deputy. But what I'm saying to you is there are always going to be a target stretched otherwise for income. Once you have a charge for income on the base that we have, and I'm not commenting on the legislation, all other things being equal, and importantly, after the clinical issues are dealt with first, you will end up with prioritising single rooms, if you have any available, and many of the hospitals won't, you will end up prioritising single rooms for private patients. Whether the target is ordinary target, stress target, or any other target, that is the impact of having a charge. And there's no point in denying that. That is that's that's you know that's part of it. Um, and as I said, policy may change on that if the Slant Care Report and the, com the committee that's sitting decides that that's practical to do so. And I'm not commenting on the policy. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned about the, um, the the funded workforce plan. So I'll certainly engage with my national HR uh, colleagues. But just to say on that. As I said, we have set limits, even though the department hadn't um, 
for you know reasons of assessment and understanding, hadn't approved the um, uh, pay number strategy that we've submitted. Um, we have been managing against that level. Um, we would continually encourage, and we have set uh, revised limits uh, to the year end in terms of WTs. We have allowed for a certain growth factor in that, and we would always say that if somebody can actually, even beyond the growth factor we've allowed for, if they can actually demonstrate, now I mean deputy in net terms, that they've actually dropped their agency in overtime below the level it was when we set the targets, i.e. the June level, we're not going to beat somebody over the head if they can show that they've actually dropped agency in overtime costs. Now, people may say that they feel that they've dropped agency in overtime costs, but if the data doesn't show it, it doesn't get supported. So that will be a part of the limit where we would say some reasonable flexibility has to allow, be allowed, but only if they're sustainably dropping the agency in overtime. Not telling us there'll be a time lag or it'll happen the month after the next or it'll happen the month after that, but it actually happens and it's sustained. Um, so now, again, with, with respect, I, I've no doubt that the... Um, and for valid reasons, the INMO's interest in the Fund work, work, Workforce Plan is as much about growing the number of nurses, not about reducing the, the agency and overtime bill. Absolutely, which we're, we would absolutely share concern, and, and nobody is against growing the number of nurses. The issue is having the resource to be able to pay for the nurses, mm -hmm. which is part of the problem I'm in here today. About so, um, so the, I'll talk to HR about <laughs> where are they in terms of. Uh, averting having to stop those planes land mm -hmm. uh, in terms of uh, the IR process that you mentioned. Okay. One very last tiny quick question. There was a report in the paper a couple of weeks ago, I think it was in the last fortnight, uh, with regard to discussions that may or may not have been, and I'm, I'm not aware that these discussions were, were not held, um, with regard to the overspend and, you know, I mean, I, they use language like out of control and all that sort of hysteria, but look, it should have to be paid for. But the, uh, there was talk of a some sort of a curtailment plan for staffing within the health service and I'm we have been there before with the recruitment moratorium it had a huge impact on services and I, I think that it was a scat I understand it wasn't it wasn't imposed by anyone um, on that side of the table I, I, I fully understand that but can you advise if there have been any discussions on that? Is that being planned as a means to control? Because what that does, and you know this as well as I do, it controls the service. It controls the services available as well as the staff cost. But is, is that something that is being considered? Thank you, Chair. No, Debbie. What, what we've done is we've set WT limits. We looked at where we were at the end of June, and we said, what can we afford to, for that to grow by? Where can it be afforded to grow by? And we've set limits at CHOs and hospital groups, and the hospital groups will set them for hospitals. That. Uh, uh, not yet. Still, some of them are still in the process of being set at that very detailed level. So that's um, for next year. But the no, this is to the end of this year, and we will also then, in the service plan, be using the same process to try and set limits for next year. Um, so we are not. I think you mentioned moratorium. We are not having a, a moratorium. We are setting affordable limits, which is what the intention is in the pay number strategy anyway. To say this is what we can afford. We can afford to go to that limit and no more. Um, easier said than done, perhaps in some areas of the health service, but that is that is the intention, and uh, we've done that to the year end 18 uh, in the last number of weeks. Um, and to the year end 18, can can we see that? Can, is that published? It's not published, but I'm sure we can make it available. I'll talk if to you. If you could, in, in as much as as can be made available to yeah. us, that you might circulate to the committee. Absolutely. Thank you, Deputy Riley. So, on behalf of the committee, I'd like to thank you, uh, Mr. Steve. Oh, so, sorry, you hadn't indicated. Uh, I hadn't indicated, actually. Uh, well, obviously, you overlooked the pressure, Deputy I suppose, Durkin, the pressure, excuse of, me, I've pressure of time and all that kind of thing. I know. But anyway, uh, and now there are a couple of questions still, uh, along the lines that um, being pursued by my, my, my colleagues there that uh, I'm not satisfied with at all. And one of them is the, this question of uh, comparison of costs with the uh, other countries, OECD countries. And I note the point made that, you know, uh, it's apples and oranges. This is what been, we've been told. And uh, the parliamentary advisor, financial advisory body have said something similar. We need the basis for, for, for this argument. You know, it's, it's not rocket science. It's simple, very simple to figure out, you know, what the level of our expenditure is, GDP or GNP or GIN or whatever it is. And, and uh, it's uh, easy to convert and compare very accurately. They say that we're in the top four or five. 
top four or five, that's internationally, that's in terms of expenditure uh, per capita. And what I would ask, and, and if the information is not available now, could we please have the information and try to, to, to adjust uh, the, 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 the barometer in such a way as to be able to compare like with like so that we know exactly what we're talking about. No. So definitely, if I could just say to the, I, I'm afraid I have to say to you, it is not accurate to say that this is easily done. Um, I can line up a whole lot of health economists who will say that to you much more eloquently than I, I am. I'm only an accountant. Um, so I'm afraid that's not, that's not factually accurate. Um, the OECD data does put Ireland in the, generally in the top seven or eight in terms of either per capita or GDP. Um, but if I could just finish, it hasn't always done that. There's been many uh, decades when we would have been behind that. I mentioned the issue of the three or four billion we spend on uh, social care and to what extent that's actually equally reported by other countries. And remember, some of these measures are you're measuring a spend on health, often total spend. So we're also well down the lead in terms of public funded health care expenditure versus total health care expenditure. That's another factor. And what I'd also say to you, Deputy, is part of the question is trying to answer is do we spend too much for what we get back on health? Now, two of the most expensive things we have in the healthcare sector, and to use the o same OEC data, um, so you know, data has to be used carefully, says that we have significantly less uh, doctors per thousand population than the OECD average. We rank somewhere around ooh, 26 of 34 on that. Um, and we have significantly less hospital beds, the single most expensive resort you have in any healthcare system. We rank somewhere around, I think it's 24th on that. That's OECD data. Um, we also have the lowest increase uh, over about an eight year period, um, putting a somewhere in number 31, using the same OECD data. So I'm not saying that that means we don't get sufficient resource. We get, you know, more than 15 billion. What I'm saying is you can't simply rely on OECD figures to say what is the answer. Again, look at the hospitals. The OECD figures say that Ireland at 94% bed occupancy consistently, we are well ahead of the 77% OECD average. And the doctors will tell you that at over 85% on a consistent basis, you are demonstrating a system that is under stress that part of the <coughs> is the department's capacity review document, and also that is a recipe for both efficiency, cost, and potentially quality issues. So that's all OECD data. Um, is it all consistent with, it, with itself? I don't know. And I'm just telling you, it, it doesn't. It isn't as simple to, to settle that question. I agree with you, Deputy. It is something that some proper body, like perhaps the SRI, should, if it's not already, seek to answer. But I, I haven't tried for a number of years. I can just tell you, it's not a straightforward thing to do. Well, Mr. Chairman, if it's not a straightforward thing, that that, that flag is that it's impossible to do, and that we can't ever do it. No. And yet everybody else does. It. That's the first thing. The second thing is this: How do we come to a situation whereby we have lesser hospital beds than than, than most of our, our partners all over Europe and the, the developed countries? Because experts came and told us we had too many hospital beds including medical experts, that we had too many hospital beds. And we were told that for a number of years, Chairman. And you know that as well as I do. So we got to that situation. And I remember being involved in, 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 in the initial stages of planning for a hospital some years ago. And uh, I thought uh, at that time, Chairman, that we need no beds at all, according to all the expert opinion that was made available. And I had to make a decision that that was not going to work. Simple as that. And I was right. So what I'm saying is this, Chairman, it's all very well to tell us, you know, the mere doll deputies, that, you know, this is not comparing like with like. It's, 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 it's apples and oranges, and it's very difficult to solve it. Well, as long as we keep on that route, Mr. Chairman, we will never provide a health service that's efficient, effective, and accessible in this country. As long as we cannot resolve these issues, drill into them, find out where the problem exists, make the comparisons, like we said already. And we'll move back to, to, to one other thing, Chairman. That's, uh, that's, uh, one of the, the all regularly trotted out is the, the demographics and the um, huge increase in the older people. And all, all I'm not sensitive about this now, even though you might think I am, but I'm not. But I want to say this, nobody ever mentions the huge increase in the younger population, which is at least comparable and counterbalances 
the increase in the older population. Because if somebody's going to tell me, uh, you know, that, that there's no increase in the young population, they're wrong. You don't have to, you don't, you don't have to do it to stats to find that information. That's readily available. We have a growing young population. And that's because of the, 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 the cohort of people who returned to this country or came into this country in one way or another. So they're counterbalancing in a positive way expenditure of, 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 and, 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 and taxation in, in, the, in relation to the matters that, that we've discussed. So I just, I just want to put a marker down here. So sometime, somewhere, somebody needs to tell us, you know, exactly. Them, instead of making the excuses and ha saying you know, this is the cause of all our problems, it's not. Them, 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 them. The question about drugs, yes, that's, that, that's an issue and needs to be dealt with and needs to be dealt with fairly effectively and, 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 and now, now. And, and the question about the state agency claims. I don't accept you know, a notion that you, we can't compare like with like and that at all. Quite simple to, 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 to check with the adjoining jurisdictions. There are norms. They're, they're averages. We can get those averages if we have to do it ourselves and find out exactly how they have lower costs than we have. So what is the cause of it? And, and Deputy O'Connor re re referred to that matter as well. So I think the, 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 the issues that that's, um, I noticed the growth in staff numbers as a result of the moratorium, etc. There has to be growth in staff numbers if we're to get back up to where we can provide a reasonable health service and we have to pay them and so on. We accept all that. But there are other issues there that are, that are diversionary, I would call them a diversionary tactic. They, they, just, they just come up. I remember them from being in the health board years ago. Same old story used to come up again and again and again. And I, I don't accept that. And the, the point I want to make, last point that I made it before, is the residential, emergency residential places. Not for the life of me will I ever understand why it is more efficient and effective to say, okay, we're going to demolish a building. Now, there are several buildings demolished in this city, uh, older buildings, over the last number of years, and replaced with newer buildings. They're no more efficient. The building, the building, the actual st structures were no better. As a matter of fact, in some cases, they were <laughs> very considerably worse and less, safe, less safety uh, conscious in the, the course of them. And don't forget this as well, and we've had this before, I'm not suggesting that uh, this is some report of a building uh, leased by the, 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 the health services or the, the Department of Health or the HSC or whoever it was, for a period of time during which it wasn't occupied. Now, I know how that can happen. But we're back now to the old story, Mr. Chairman, of projections. It shouldn't happen. And in your own household or in your own business, anybody with a business, and if they were to, 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 do, to, to rent a building uh, in anticipation of being in it by, by a particular time, that's the only time that they're going to pay for. They're not going to, they're not going to rent the building and keep it in good, in, in good faith for the owner of the building or to such time as they have enough money to pay for it. It doesn't work that way. So we need, we need to, 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 you know, break down the barriers that are there, telling us, people tell us all the time, you know, really and, and truly, I have come to the belief, you know, that we get told whatever is, happens to be uh, reasonably uh, uh, available at the time, and we walk away then. And, you know, at a certain time, you get tired of walking away. And if you're around for an awful long time, your, your memory doesn't altogether go all, all in one day, you know. And you remember all these things, and having the same thing said to you before, Chairman, you know this. You have to say, where did I hear that before? And why do I not want to hear it again? And the answer is this. It doesn't work. It doesn't tally. And because it doesn't tally, in an area of a big budget, like the health services, we need to deal with that as a matter of urgency. Thank you, Deputy Durkin. Some final comments? Yes. A couple of factual points, and, and Deputy Drocken raised them just because it has been mentioned. Minister for Finance announced on the budget day the OECD had placed us fifth in terms of the EU28 in terms of the per capita piece. But I would point out all the qualifiers that Mr Mulvaney raised are very, very valid points to make in that context. Uh, he's wrong, is he, no, he's not. He's absolutely factually correct. But I'm simply saying Mr Mulvaney has explained, and we would agree, there are quite a lot of underlying qualifiers when you're reading international data. That's all I'm saying, Deputy, there. The capacity review provides for considerable approach to enhancing the bed capacity in the health sector, and the Minister has funded that, and that is uh, clearly a 
a priority as it's launched care amongst the reform processes that we have underway. Um, in relation to the department's headquarters, the, OE, the OPW was before a committee recently and gave the explanation on that process and that is the appropriate agency that should do that because it was responsible for uh, uh, delivering that uh, building for, for the department um, in relation to um, younger people. I think you make a very fair point, Deputy. Absolutely, the ageing population does bring with it the great benefits of what the health sector has achieved in recent years with longevity, but it brings certain costs, as we explained. But with younger people, really, the shift towards a primary care delivery and care in the community, which is underpinned and reaffirmed, because it has been there, reaffirmed by Slauncha Care, has to be the basis upon which we try and develop a service which is closer to people within the community and prevents us with another generation of people moving into services which are more costly and not appropriate. But just a few points I wanted to make, Chair, that may assist there. With the Chair, I say, just, Debbie, just, just put on the record, <coughs> I meant absolutely no disrespect to yourself or any other TDs in terms of the complex nature of using OECD statistics. It's simply to point out that they are. I also wasn't intending to be defeatist. It is something we do need to get to the bottom of. We do need to be able to say how, how best can we compare. I just, my point would be, it is some um, expert body, perhaps like the SRI, it may already be in some work that they're doing, that would need to do that for it to be credible and, and believed. And while you're, you're absolutely correct, Deputy, there is, um, Ireland has comparatively, again, another EU statistic, a younger population. It is ageing faster than uh, EU countries. Unfortunately, in terms of healthcare costs, the younger population does not counterbalance the elderly population. Younger, younger people typically have a lower draw on healthcare costs, particularly outside the first uh, year of life, than elderly population. Um, thanks, Chair. Thank you very much, Mr Mulvaney. So, uh, on behalf of the committee, I'd like to thank you, Mr Mulvaney, um, Chief Financial, fin Financial Officer and Deputy General of the HSE. Uh, Colum Desmond uh, Financial Unit in the HSE and Fiona Pendergast. Thank you very much for coming in. As we've no further business, this committee is adjourned until Wednesday the 14th of November.